everyone and welcome to this event that is bringing us together this afternoon organized by transport and environment tne my name is anna and i will be your moderator for this afternoon it's great to see so many of you here uh, here in the room after such a uh, a long time but it's also great to see so many of you joining us online i think it's more than 200 people at least that will be tuning in uh, online today so to all of you also welcome and we look forward to your participation this afternoon we are very glad to be hosting this hybrid event in brussels also online we're going to have uh, 10 speakers joining us here in the room but also 10 more speakers that will be joining us uh, online from their respective houses, headquarters, which proves that one thing, which is that we do not always need to travel uh, very far to be able to exchange, to be able to learn new things and to attend and participate in important events and policy discussions like the one we are having today. So what brings us together here today? What's the first thing that probably comes to your mind when we think about the climate impacts of aviation? It's probably going to be CO2 effects, right? But this is only the tip of the iceberg, as we very fittingly see in our illustration today. And that's because non-CO2 effects account for two thirds of aviation's full climate impact. This was confirmed by a European Union Aviation Safety Authority report that was released back in November 2020, a groundbreaking study on this matter. It's been more than a year now. So what has been happening since? What are the key policy actions? What's the latest um, updated science. Despite the AA's report proposing mitigation measures to reduce these effects, none of them made it into the EU's Fit for 55 package and non-CO2 effects risk being once again under the legislative radar. So that's exactly what we're going to be talking today. What are the key actions in the political front, in the scientific front that have been put forward since, uh, since that report came out? Which technological solutions are currently available to be addressing that? And not the least important, what can EU institutions, what can member states, what can the industry do better in order to address this important topic? So today we are creating this platform for constructive dialogue across sectors, across uh, stakeholders, institutions, to talk about non-CO2 mitigation, to show that there is room for everyone to be doing better in this front. If you want to know more, transport and environment, recently released a roadmap to climate neutral aviation in Europe, where there's a specific chapter dedicated to non-CO2 effects of aviation. So we'd, be, we'd welcome you to, to read that through after the event if you want to know more about this. Before we get started with our first speakers, some, of course, uh, housekeeping rules. Um, we have some of our speakers that will also be joining us online. Uh, our audience joining online will be able to ask questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. You'll probably see me as a bit of a broken record with that, but please use the Q&A function, not the chat for that, so that we can monitor better the questions that are coming and going. The event is being recorded. It's being filmed also inside the room. And the presentations that speakers will be showing will be shared after the event. So without further ado, to kick off our session, I'm delighted to have on stage William Potts, he's the executive director at TNE for some welcome words. So, William, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you in person, with some of you in person, uh, many more online. It's, uh, this is, I guess, the brave new world we are now in, the hybrid world. Um, in other parts of our work, we are not so keen on hybrids. I think in this, you know, in this world, we're, we're okay with hybrid solutions. We're talking today about non-CO2, uh, but I want to I wanna kick off by mentioning uh, the CO2 part of the aviation sector uh, a little bit, because the events that are taking place east of us in Ukraine, I think for me, underscore the importance of Europe shifting away from oil as soon as we can. I think it needs to be said again and again and again the cost of oil in terms of climate, but also in terms of funding the war that is happening in Ukraine is unacceptable. We need to shift our entire transport system, which is the largest consumer of oil, away from imported oil and start deploying renewable-based electrons at scale as fast as we can. And that goes for each part of the sector. It also goes for the aviation sector, which is, for better or worse, the sector that the oil industry continues to count on for increased demand in the future. So this is an extremely important time 
we have the Fit for 55 on the table. The Green Deal is going to be hopefully adopted this year. This is a time to accelerate. It's not a time to waver. So I had to get that off my chest uh, before we start talking about non-CO2. We all in this room and online, we all understand that shifting to hydrogen, e-kerosene, sustainable aviation fuels, that this will not completely solve the aviation climate problem. We have known that since 1999, when the IPCC published its first report, and it's a landmark report uh, in, in our world, on the non-CO2 impacts of aviation. Now, since 1999, a lot of research has happened. We have learned a lot, and a lot of uncertainties have been, you know, have been narrowed. I think we know a lot more about solutions that are available. And you know, that is why we have convened this meeting today. Uh, a year or two years ago, we had the EASA report, the EASA report, which was really an excellent contribution to the, you know, to the state of the art, uh, to state of discussion, which showed us that non-CO2 can make up up to two thirds of aviation's global warming impact. Um, it is, in a way, it's the elephant in the room, the elephant in the room that we haven't been addressing. We've been researching it, but now it is time to move beyond research and move on to action. Now, I understand it is a complex issue and we will hear from a number of speakers what some of the uncertainties are, what some of the problems are, but I think it's also clear that we, we cannot spend another 20 years researching this topic. We need to make a move. We're going to hear from EASA, from Eurocontrol, on the work they're doing in terms of testing um, and advancing some of the potential mitigation solutions. We're going to hear from the Commission, from the European Parliament, from Member States, what they're considering in the context of Fit for 55. A number of amendments have been put forward to, you know, to change the Refuel EU to, uh, to amend the aviation ETS. Uh, there's a number of really interesting suggestions there that we hope we can discuss today. But we will also hear from industry, and that is extremely important to, to me and to us as an organization. Uh, we know that this is a problem that we cannot solve just with regulators and scientists. It's a problem that requires collaboration across, across the system, across the entire aviation sector. So we are really looking forward to having a, an open discussion with all of you today on how we can chart a pathway beyond research towards action. I hope today will be an important milestone there. And I hope on a personal note that we, that we will stop seeing non-CO2 just as a complex problem. I think if you consider the aviation system and the aviation emissions uh, problem, you know, with a step back, you will see that it's a hard sector. We all, we all know it's a hard sector. The plan is to go away from oil, from fossil, to green electrons, hydrogen, electricity, e-kerosene, that's gonna take us a long time. What are the low hanging fruits that we have in let's say the next decade? Might it actually be that some of the low hanging fruits we have are in the non-CO2 space, maybe changing the aromatics, changing the, the fuel quality, maybe rerouting some flights might actually be one of the easiest things we can do to significantly improve the aviation industry's impact on the climate. It might actually be one of the cheaper ways too. But that's, that's, that's on a personal note. I hope that will be the conclusion, but of course I cannot, uh, I cannot predict. Final word from my side, the aviation industry is a, is a big and important European industry. I think it is an industry that is at, it, at its best when it embraces new technologies, when it embraces new innovation, when it you know, demonstrates a can-do attitude. I think those are for me the key words for today. I hope we can, you know, in the spirit of innovation, collaboration and can-do attitude, discuss how we can make progress on this extremely important issue. So thank you so much for joining to those of you in person and thanks to all of you online as well. I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, William and Tiani, for, for hosting us here and for setting the scene so nicely on the topics that we're going to be covering today. The elephant in the room, really, that we're going to be talking about. Now, as we have just mentioned, so the European Union Aviation Safety Authority has confirmed that non-CO2 effects have a very harmful impact on our environment. So to talk about this, I'm delighted to welcome Patrick Key. He's the Executive Director at the ASA. Thank you very much, Patrick, for being with us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I have a cold, but it's not COVID. Uh, I tested this morning. I can guarantee to you uh, as, as far as I can. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here today. 
and to address this uh, important topic uh, of non-CO2 emissions. There can be no doubt uh, citizens expect aviation to take urgent action to address its impact on climate. The pandemic crisis of the last two years, which for a short period almost brought international air travel to a standstill, has uh, had the secondary impact of focusing the minds of many on the urgency of actions to reduce the overall negative impact of humanity on the, on the environment. While aviation was already well aware of the need for action in this respect, activity has stepped up, stepped up considerably in the last two years. We have a series of short-term actions in place, complemented by an intense effort to reduce the carbon footprint and other environmental impacts of aviation in the longer term through new technologies. In the short term, aviation's contribution to reaching climate targets will require widespread adoption of sustainable aviation fuels, as well as market-based measures such as ETS and Corsia. We are also looking at operational improvements that can reduce fuel consumption and therefore also emissions. Longer term, novel technologies such as hydrogen powered and electric aircraft uh, will be needed to deliver a step change, particularly for commercial aviation. Such programs are being tackled aggressively by manufacturers who understand the urgency to find alternative and greener solutions while ensuring that new designs and technologies meet the high safety standards we have established in aviation. I was discussing this with uh, William. Uh, we in EASA are committed to support our industry in all their actions, and we are also increasing our knowledge on all those new technologies. There have been uh, recently a multitude of net zero CO2 emissions targets set by individual companies, industry associations and governments in order to support emission reductions that align with the Paris Agreement goal for global warming not to exceed 1.5 degrees. However, aviation's climate, and this is the topic of today's meeting, aviation's climate impact is not limited to CO2 emissions alone. A significant contribution is made by non-CO2 emissions such as oxides of nitrogen or NOx, soot particles, oxidized sulfur species, and water vapor, better known as contrails. In 2019, the European Commission requested from EASA an updated analysis on the non-CO2 effects on aviation, of aviation on climate change to fulfill the requirements of the EU emissions trading system directive. This EASA study, which was uh, mentioned before, was published in November 2020 and built on the latest scientific knowledge to present a fresh analysis of the main climate impacts associated with air traffic beyond carbon dioxide emissions. The study examines the current level of scientific knowledge and the remaining uncertainties on the climate change effects of non-CO2 aviation emissions the existing technological and operational options that are applied to limit or reduce non-CO2 impacts from aviation and related trade-off issues, the potential policy actions required to reduce non-CO2 climate impacts, the pros and cons of these, and the associated knowledge gaps. The report concluded that the following actions and follow-through was required. First, that work is still needed to better understand the climate impact of non-CO2 emissions as, as there is still a significant level of uncertainty on the existing scientific evaluation. And that's really something that I want to, 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 um, to underline, which is that uh, we had created for this study a scientific committee which had a lot of debates, a lot of discussions on how to evaluate the impact of the different non-CO2 emissions on the climate. And also importantly, the relationship between those different dimensions, because it would be too simple if we could reduce, by re reducing CO2 emissions, we could at the same time reduce all non-CO2 emissions with a positive impact on climate. It is very, very likely that uh, we would need to find trade-offs between different solutions. To give you a very simple example, contrails. If you want to avoid contrails, you may have to constrain the trajectory of an aircraft 
to fly at an altitude and on a route which are not the optimal altitude and routes for in terms of fuel consumption and therefore CO2 emissions. And it will all be a question of what is the right trade-off between contrail formation and CO2 emissions or non-CO2 emissions such as NOx and SO2. So I really do think I'm convinced that we need to better understand in detail the models of the behavior of those non-CO2 emissions uh, and the impact on climate. This is key to all the actions that we need to take in the future. And as such, it is therefore important to have regular reviews of the latest scientific understanding on non-CO2 impacts. There is no truth for the, for the time being on uh, the impact of non-CO2 em emissions on, 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 on the environment. And we need to have not absolute truth, but we need to know uh, better what, what the truth is. The third action which was recommended in the report was to maintain and uh, regularly review the existing ICAO environmental certification standards with respect to CO2, NOx, and non-volatile particle matter. And the, the fourth uh, recommendation was to say that the use of SAF, sustainable aviation fuels, should be increased as it provides a demonstrable reduction in both CO2 and non-CO2 emissions. In particular, for instance, less aromatics leads to less soot and contrails. The proposed refuel EU legislation aims to, pro pro to introduce mandatory volumes of SAF to be supplied to operators. The re report also concluded that uh, further research is needed, potentially through Horizon Europe at EU level, with the aim of increasing certainty on the climate impact from non-CO2 emissions that I mentioned already, considering different metrics and time horizons that could be used to assess the impact of potential policy measures, enhancing existing analytical methods to estimate aircraft non-CO2 emissions in crews based on ICAO certified landing and takeoff emissions data, enhancing the capability to predict accurately the formation of persistent controls ensuring coordination by bringing together experts to discuss the scientific understanding and review project results. We are currently discussing with the European Commission in order to see if, in, in which conditions and if we can continue to work on non-CO2 research and what would be the time frame for undertaking new studies on the subject. We are at the same time starting to work on concrete actions such as preparing our SAF monitoring role, which is part of refuel EU aviation, and guiding new SAF fuel producers through the SAF approval process via a new EU clearinghouse project. In 2018, you may be aware of that, but EASA was assigned additional responsibilities in the area of environmental protection through what we call our basic regulation. Part of our remit is to compile a regular report, the European Aviation Environmental Report, on the environmental performance of the sector and performance evolution. And our next version of this report is going to be published in July of this year. It will include not only an, an evaluation of the environmental performance of the sector, but also recommendations to improve the level of environmental protection. EASA compiles these recommendations from our unique position as an independent, objective, and technical agency. Our decisions are, of course, aligned with the political imperative to act on climate change, but they are not bound by financial or other political considerations. And in this context, we welcome and appreciate cooperation with uh, um, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations and particularly with transport and environment, whom I thank again for inviting us. Your long established credentials in the area of environment means they have a valuable perspective and can keep us honest, if I may say so, which enhances the credibility with the general public of any measures we can recommend. And I'm very delighted that we have now signed just a couple of minutes ago with William an agreement on teaming together on uh, EASA's environmental label. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I was uh, able to give you some overview of EASA's current activities in this critical area and demonstrate to you that we are committed to take the actions needed to limit the impact of aviation on the environment as quickly as possible. 
Rest assured also that safety, as always, will be our primary concern as we implement these measures. And I wish you a very fruitful and successful afternoon. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much for a great overview indeed and for giving us like this taste of the main policy recommendations of what's uh, one of the things that we're going to be discussing throughout this afternoon. So thanks a lot again for, for being with us. Um, now I would like to welcome, this time joining us online, uh, Ms. Clara de la Torre, Deputy Director General at the European Commission's Directorate General for Climate Action, to give us a perspective from EU policymakers. Clara, welcome and thank you for being with us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to Transport and Environment for your invitation. I have to apologize in advance. I'm connecting to you via telephone because uh, when, just when the event started, I had a huge connection problems. Can you hear me well? well yes, we can. Yes, thanks, Clara. Yeah, thank you, and I apologize for that. So thank you, as I was saying, for, for your invitation because this event is, uh, is, is I'm sure it's going to be uh, to, to represent a, an important uh, contribution to shed some light on 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 uh, on this uh, phenomena and uh, in helping us in thinking forward how to 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 address mitigation of uh, of those uh, non CO2 effects of uh, aviation. Um, Patrick I has been uh, reminding the, 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 the study that EASA did in 2020, and it came uh, as an important, uh, an important summary, among others, of the research that was uh, carried out for a whole decade on the matter. And, um, and science, fortunately, evolves, and it's becoming clearer and clearer. And, um, and um, uh, this, is, this should be the basis for whatever action uh, we, we take. As previous speakers have said, and we all know, that we have uh, uncertainties that, that remain and will remain for decades, likely, on the total impact of, of, uh, of, uh, of aviation. Um, but um, my main message today is that, um, according to our, our current uh, state of knowledge, the remaining uncertainties uh, should be taken as, uh, as, uh, as a risk to be assessed when we are thinking of possible uh, um, policies that we would be uh, uh, designing to address uh, these matters, rather than the, uh, the, the uncertainty being something which prevents uh, any further policy action. So this is uh, a bit in line, more than a bit, in line with the precautionary uh, principle. As it has been mentioned, we should not forget that, uh, that uh, we have programs like Horizon Europe, uh, which have a long-standing ambition uh, in terms of aviation in many different respects, but not least in reducing the climate effects of uh, aviation in the path that the, 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 the sector itself has set for itself as uh, becoming uh, climate uh, neutral. So we have collaborative research, which helps a lot in enhancing the, the, the knowledge capacity of, uh, uh, of, of, of all of us. And it's also an important support to the, to the partnership on, on, on clean aviation. So turning to the three questions that uh, you have, uh, you have uh, asked us to, to address. The first one is, uh, what's the research and policy actions that have, uh, have occurred since this uh, EASA report? But we've been looking to, to scientific, uh, scientific uh, publications, and we've, we are aware we've been going through at least 10 of them uh, since the, the release of, of, of EASA's report. And all of them are looking at climate impact for, uh, uh, of aviation through different angles. Some of these studies are focusing on better quantification of this impact, some others in ways to incentivize further action, some others go into dedicated topics as the benefits of fuel sufficiency or the strong need as for any policy to monitor, report and verify non-CO2 emissions, uh, creating um, models for climate profile of, of, the, of the flights. So there are, there are um, there are, and there are uh, studies precisely devoted as well to explore how to manage the, the uncertainties in, while seeking ways to, to, to address, uh, to, to mitigate the outcome. 
On the second question about the, what are the technological solutions that already exist, uh, um, as, as we know, there, there, is, there is no uh, solution. And as Patrick was saying, there are always trade-offs in whatever solutions we, are, we can think of at this moment. But there are possibly two low-hanging um, low solutions uh, to, to mitigate the, 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 the non-CO2 in the short term. And these come, of course, in addition to, to the natural win-win approach of, uh, the, of the total climate impacts, uh, like the, 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 the uh, mandatory uptake of sustainable aviation uh, uh, fuels. So the first is the reduction of uh, aromatics, naphthalene, and sulfur in the jet fuel. And I understand that with a cost estimated recently at not much more than 10 euros per ton of fuel for this treatment, can, uh, aromatics and others can be can be can be halved uh, compared with the current uh, performance. So this measure looks like uh, an important an important uh, the, uh, avenue to, to explore. Um, more than than more data on the contents of aromatics and and naphthalene and sulfur, as well as the impact assessment uh, of uh, of all this. Needs, uh, needs to be well taken into consideration when making any policy proposals on the, on the jet uh, uh, fuel uh, topic. The second avenue is, uh, as it was being referred to, the optimization of the flight trajectories. So according to, to recent studies, precisely in the context of CESAR, uh, the, 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 the joint undertaking that, that we have with, uh, on, on, on uh, traffic management, um, so according to one of the studies, they were saying monitoring, reporting, and verification of data re relative precisely to non-CO2 in flight could allow to create a, a climate profile per localization of the aircraft. Of course, this is not an easy matter. And, uh, and uh, of course, it needs an important uh, risk assessment uh, to ensure the, 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 the degree of confidence that we can have in the mitigation uh, against that can be, can be achieved by that token. The last question is what, uh, what can the EU institutions and the member states do? Um, it is, of course, uh, highly recommended to invest uh, time and effort in this topic, uh, as it as is already done by some member states and by numerous stakeholders. And the goal is precisely to incentivize uh, research and knowledge capacities with close relations involving closely industry and the education sector, but also thinking of, uh, if, when possible, uh, of policy options on how to tackle both the CO2 and the non-CO2 effects in a cost-efficient way. It is a complex matter, but as I was saying, uh, there are still uncertainties overall, but we have enough evidence, we think, to start considering uh, policy options while at the same time reinforcing our the knowledge bases on uh, and and our techniques and our data and our basis for impact assessment for whatever measure. So thank you very much for having raised this uh, this subject and apologies for, for my um, connection problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara. To you. For, for making the time to, to be with us this afternoon. Um, and right, last but not least, before we kick uh, in our first, uh, our first panel, we have a pre-recorded speech from the Director General of Civil Aviation at the French Ministry of Transport, which is currently holding the EU Council Presidency. So we're gonna hear a few uh, words from uh, Damien Cazé, Director General for Civil Aviation. Non-CO2 effects of aviation are not a recent discovery. They have been in the line of sight of the European Commission since 2006, starting with a potential NOx regulation and leading to the conclusion that all knowledge on the subject was considered insufficient and too uncertain to act upon. As a decade has passed, 
the European Commission and member states were able to initiate the necessary research to deepen the scientific knowledge behind these effects. France, through its Civil Aeronautics Research Council, CORAC, has strived to develop both scientific and industrial research projects to increase knowledge and reduce our uncertainties on the impact of the various high altitude emissions of aviation. Those efforts have lately been extended to the impact of newly considered fuels as hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuel. The publicly supported research efforts conducted in France are divided into one scientific transversal project, clean aviation and two fuel-specific projects. The Clean Aviation Research Project, endowed with 12 million euros over five years, is led by our National Research Agency on Aeronautics, ONERA, and the world-class climate lab, the Pierre Simon Laplace Institute. Its ambition is to better understand the different emissions and processes constituting non-CO2 effects. Then, two types of future fuel are under investigation. Drop-in sustainable aviation fuel on hydrogen, paving the way to define the optimal scope of use of these technologies. Until this research brings substantiated results, solutions to minimize the climatic impact of aviation exist. Incremental innovation has already allowed the current generation of aircraft engines to have the lowest emissions, not only of CO2, but also of particles overall. And those new generation aircrafts represent only 13% of the global fleet. Aircraft renewal represents, therefore, a significant lever to reduce all emissions in the short to medium term. Moreover, these state-of-the-art systems can be powered by sustainable aviation fuel. Not only is the use of these fuels the main decarbonization lever for the aviation sector in the short and long term, but the use of fuel without aromatics would also reduce these non-CO2 effects. Scientific advances on high supersaturated regions will hopefully also open field to what is called green operations, that is altering routes to avoid these areas if the overall effect is climate positive. These scientific uncertainties about the magnitude of non-CO2 effects and the negative collateral effects that could be associated with the implementation of corrective measures make it difficult to define the actions to be taken. These measures may indeed have negative effects on the climate or on air quality. With this in mind, it is important to act cautiously and to implement only the measures whose consequences are clear, for which we know that we will have no regrets. Firstly, by promoting a massive use of SAF. France is one of the pioneering states in this field. Even before the Commission proposed the refuel regulation, our national roadmap sets blending targets of 2% in 2025 and 5% in 2030, 
on our second low carbon national strategy, SNBC2, sets a 50% incorporation level in 2050. France is also one of the very first countries to impose a 1% incorporation mandate for advanced biofuels starting this year. At the European level, in the framework of the ongoing negotiations on the refuel regulations, we are working as the presidency to build a compromise as ambitious as possible to define a trajectory of incorporation mandates by 2050 for SAF and synthetic fuels. In addition, the text provides that the Commission shall inform Member States and the Parliament in its report on the implementation of the regulation on technological progress in the field of research and innovation with regard to the reduction of emissions other than CO2. This will allow to take relevant measures on the basis of the latest knowledge. At IKEO level, it is important that CAEP continues to work on the assessment of the role of fuel composition in emission characteristics, following on from the initial work that has already been undertaken on this subject. France supports the continuation of this work in the next cycle, in order to better understand how fuel composition could be regulated and thus better control particulate emissions. Other measures with clear consequences are all the improvements made, whether in engines, aircraft, or traffic management, which contribute to reduce fuel consumption for the same service provided. They are beneficial as the amount of precursor emissions is reduced accordingly. The reinforcement of CAEP standards on engine emissions, taking into account as much as necessary the interdependence between engine emissions and noise control, is thus an option to be pursued. In conclusion, caution is the primary guidance and the first axis that of fundamental research should always be called upon. The analysis of emissions during SAF combustion or any blend of SAF and kerosene and the optimization of the resulting fuel composition are areas of research to be pursued. From this perspective, measures on fuel composition are interesting to explore, but their potential benefits must be confirmed. An evolution of the jet fuel standards therefore seems premature at this stage. Similarly, in the context of the current negotiations on the revision of the ETS directive, the priority must remain the gradual removal of free allowances. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to Mr. Damian Kaze. He could unfortunately not be with us uh, today, but at least it was great to hear from, uh, from, his, uh, from his speech, from his pre-recorded speech. So now we're going to have our first panel today where we're going to be setting the scene on what's been going on on the policy front and in the scientific front as well. So if uh, we have seen that the there's been, or we get the feeling that not much has been going on since that uh, 2020, November 2020 report. So what's been happening since from a commission perspective, from a member state perspective, and also from a scientific point of view. So if, uh, first of all, if I may uh, introduce, uh, if I may have on a stage the, the speakers that will be joining us here on, on stage, and we can kick off the panel. 
we have Mark with us, and I think uh, Douglas is with us. Great. Excellent. So I think we have a stellar panel with us um, joining us uh, this uh, afternoon. So we have with us, uh, first of all, Mark Stedler. He's a senior lecturer in transport and the environment at the Imperial College in London. So thanks a lot, Mark, for being with us. We also have with us also joining uh, on stage uh, Magnus Gislev. He's a team leader on sustainable aviation at DG Move in the European Commission. And joining us online, we have, uh, first of all, uh, Jutta Paulus, a member of the European Parliament with the Greens. Thanks a lot for, for being with us. And Mr. Falk Heinen, he's a representative of the German Ministry of the Environment, working on air pollution control technology for transport and fuels. So to all of you, it's great uh, that you are with us. Um, so I would like to first uh, touch upon a little bit on the, um, again, on the, on, on the scientific perspective. And I think it would be very interesting to start with uh, Mark, if uh, you could talk to us through in uh, recent years, how much progress have we seen on the science on non-CO2 effects from, from aviation? What are some of the things that we know now that maybe just a couple of years ago we may not uh, have known? Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Can, you. can you hear me? I think... Thank, uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, I mean, as it was said in the, in, in the introduction to this event, uh, understanding of non-CO2 effects is not new. Um, there was an IPCC report in 1999. Um, over the last couple of years, though, um, efforts have been going towards reducing the uncertainties, improving understanding. And it has already been stated today that non-CO2 effects of aviation account for two-thirds of the radiative forcing associated with aviation. Of that, contrails are the most significant. So contrails and NOx are the two primary non-CO2 components. Contrails on their own account for about 57% of the radiative forcing associated with aviation. And while uncertainty is higher than it is for CO2, the uncertainty bars keep the radiative forcing estimate in the positive. Okay, so it's, it's not as if we are uncertain as to whether there's a cooling or a warming effect. It's pretty much almost certainly a warming effect. Okay, there is some uncertainty around the magnitude of that, but it is a warming effect. Um, <clears throat> what, a second point is that the effect of different flights is not equal. So we, from our analysis, we understand that certain flights have a really significant warming effect. Certain flights, and in fact, most flights have no significant contrail impact. And some flights have a cooling effect. So if you go outside after today's event, you'll see aircraft in the sky, and you might see some contrails, very short-lived contrails being formed. They'll disappear very quickly, at least they did when I was coming into the event today. Okay, so today's contrails outside, above our heads, aren't really a significant warming, having a significant warming effect. From our analysis, what we see is that Nighttime contrails during winter time typically have the most highest probability of being very significantly warming. The third point that we understand over the last couple of years is that um, measurements at cruise show us that changing the fuel properties does change the particle emissions properties and the contrail properties. Okay, so producing fewer soot particles from combustion or alternative fuels which produce less soot, they burn cleaner leads to contrails which aren't as optically active, and they, um, they also, from what we would assume from that, they, they last long, uh, shorter, so they have a shorter lifetime, which means that the overall climate effect of those contrails with those alternative fuels would be lower. I could go on, but I think. Thank you very much for, for, for this great overview. I think it sets the scene very nicely to what we're going to, to discuss, because We've mentioned before that there's a lot of uncertainty, but there's also an increasing evidence on, on this matter. So if I could now turn to uh, Magnus Gislev uh, from a European Commission perspective. So since that uh, November 2020, it has a report. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious to understand more what has the European Commission been doing to, to address this topic, to address uh, non-CO2 effects. If you could update us on, on that. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to all and thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting also uh, uh, other parts of the European Commission, which is in my case uh, DG Move, Mobility and Transport. I'm in the um, Aviation Policy Unit there and I'm team leader for environmental aspects. I'm joined here uh, this afternoon by my colleague uh, Georges Pinto, who is, uh, among other things, dealing with uh, non-CO2 effects. So um, what I'd first like to stress in this uh, panel when, where we are setting the scene for, for uh, follow-up discussions uh, later on is that in the invitation it was mentioned uh, that um, we are only addressing the tip of the iceberg and uh, there was also reference to two-thirds of, of um, climate impacts being coming from non-CO2. Um, it is true that I spend most of my time worrying about CO2, um, much more than I spend worrying about non-CO2, but the updated analysis of uh, IASA clearly shows that, and it confirms that uh, aviation's non-CO2 impacts on our climate are at least as important as those of CO2 alone. And let me just clarify that uh, while the work uh, on putting together the updated analysis uh, was done by uh, EASA, uh, as also mentioned by uh, uh, Patrick Key, um, the Commission stands firmly behind uh, the analysis and adopted basically a, an executive summary of this analysis um, that was, you know, subject to formal inter-service consultations and so on, the normal commission procedure. But I'd also like to point out there was no polit political interference in uh, how we presented and how we adopted the uh, results of the report. It was adopted as IASA had written it, uh, including what IASA had an analyzed regarding the six potential policy measures that they had identified. So coming to these, um, it was also mentioned in the invitation a bit strangely that none of the six uh, made it into the Fit for 55 package. And I would uh, really have uh, some disagreement with that because the mandatory supply and use of sustainable aviation fuels that we heard several speakers talking about earlier today um, was one of the six recommendations that were that were made in the uh, updated an analysis. And this is precisely what the Commission proposed in its refuel EU uh, aviation proposal for regulation, a regulation setting up mandatory uh, blending schedule for sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and this was also actually uh, referred to by Mr. Kaze as well. Um, let me just say a few words about that proposal. Uh, the proposal is un uh, currently undergoing the legislative process in the EU, but we expect it will still be adopted this year. Uh, the use of SAF would in principle be a win-win solution reducing both CO2 and non-CO2 emissions. And this is assuming that the, uh, there are no increases in the aromatic or sulfur content uh, of the fossil-based part uh, of the blended fuel that could negate any benefits from uh, sustainable aviation fuels. And we think that that will not be the case. And SAF could even be a win-win-win uh, solution, as it could also uh, reduce local air pollution uh, around airports. And the refuel EU uh, proposal also addresses the risk of tankering, fuel tankering outside the EU. And under refuel EU, IASA will indeed have uh, access to key data regarding the composition of the uh, fuel blend making it possible to determine emissions of different fuel blends. And this will in turn enable IASA 
to do a technical analysis regarding non-CO2 emissions and the use of SAF. Uh, it's also worth men mentioning that um, the future zero, uh, zero carbon aircraft uh, technologies should also uh, provide non-CO2 benefits. Uh, and this is provided that the combustion system is, is optimized. So out of the six uh, policy actions, we concluded that more research was needed on the other five, while potential co-benefits uh, on non-CO2 could also arise from the um, proposals in the Fit for 55 package on the emissions trading system and the energy taxation directive. Uh, so, the, what I just said about uh, additional uh, research applies as well to the potential inclusion of NOx, uh, NOx emissions in the EU ETS, uh, where the updated analysis found that the uncertainties of NOx emissions um, are significantly higher than those of CO2, and that there is a need to uh, pay attention to the credibility of the uh, emissions trading system in that regard. Eh? And I'm coming to the end. Um, the analysis also recognizes uncertainties about the direction of uh, climate impact of NOx in the future, because where there uh, is warm, whether there is warming or, uh, or cooling is dependent on background concentrations of other pollutants. Finally, uh, regarding the uh, operational improvements and air traffic management, uh, including avoidance of ice supersaturated areas, the EU is continuing to fund research on this uh, in, uh, under Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, and under CESAR. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, about some of these um, results in the um, couple and in the next couple of panels. Thank you very much, Magnus. If I can turn now to uh, MEP Jutta Paulus. So uh, you are the ITER reporter for the Refuel EU for, for aviation. Um, I would like to, to understand more, like which, which proposals uh, or, or which amendments um, are you uh, putting forward to address non-CO2 effects? To which extent there is a scope within the Fit for 55 package in this exciting uh, policy context that we are at the moment to, to address non-CO2 effects? Yes, thank you very much for this important event and thanks for inviting me. And as you have said, I'm the rapporteur for the ITRA opinion. This file is distributed among three committees. So the Tran committees in the lead and the ITRA Industry Research Energy and the NV Environment Environment um, Committees can bring forward opinions. And as rapporteur, of course, your um, your task is not to bring forward your own opinion only, but to try and find a compromise between all political groups, so as to deliver a reasonable opinion which reflects the view of the ITRA committee. So what I'm I've been trying to do is taking an, an industry angle here. So um, in my opinion, um, having SAFs and not only biofuels, but actually scalable SAFs, which is um, synthetic fuels, because the harvest factor for energy is so much better if you use wind or solar as compared to biofuels. Um, I've tried to bring forward a quota for synthetic fuels already in 2025 which the commission has done only for 2030. And of course, to raise the quota for 2030 in order to give a clear signal to the industry that the time to invest in these technologies is now. And that it is also a chance, an opportunity for the European Union to become the global leader for this technology. Because at the end of the day, everyone has signed the Paris Agreement. Everyone has committed to become climate neutral and in my opinion, European Union is a bit late with 2050 because the uh, developed countries should move faster. That's what was agreed upon in Paris. So at the end of the day, everyone will have to look for sustainable aviation fuels. So the ones that have been the early birds in producing them will actually have an advantage. And that's what I'm trying to convene to my colleagues in ITRA and we're 
making a good progress, I would say. Um, of course, we would need 100% SAFs by 2050 at the latest, because it doesn't make sense um, being climate neutral in 2050, but still using 37% fossil fuels in aviation, which would be the case if um, we would stick to the commission proposal, which says 63% SAFs in 2050. Um, and also I have tried to put in something on non-CO2 effects, namely on um, limiting the amount of aromatics and sulfur in jet fuel. I know that this is also a safety issue because uh, those seals that are in the engines are swollen due to aromatic content. But I think um, as the uh, ICAO has limited, has said we need at least 8% of aromatics in jet fuel. Well, why not limit it to 8%? If 8% is a safe level, then we should go for 8% now. And then of course we can do further research in order to find out whether we can still lower these limits. This of course could be taken into account when the, um, when the guideline would be revised in 2027 or 2028. But what we could also do already now is decrease the level of sulfur because we know that sulfur is also um, a factor when contrails are, are formed um, during aviation. Um, also what I try to put in there is to um, broaden the scope so that we will not only have the largest airports um, being, being, being taken into the, into the directive because then we will end up with a European Union of two speeds. With a, where the large airports already use SAFs and the small airports will end up in 2035 saying, well, we don't have any infrastructure. How are we going to use those SAFs? Everything is going to the big airports. So we think that there should be a derogation for autonomous regions, no question about that. And of course the larger airports should go on quicker, but we need to already see in the future that the smaller airports have to be included also. And of course, what the commission has not put in the proposal at all are the private flights, which are only 2% of all flights. I know it's only 2% of emissions, but I don't see a reason why the family that is flying to Mallorca once a year will have to pay a pr higher price of fuel due to the SAF inclusion, but the Paris Hiltons and Kim Kardashians and Elon Musk's have. Have, not, have no such obligation. That doesn't make sense. So um, there is also an issue which we are currently discussing at the ITRE committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suta Paulo, for introducing many interesting ideas and, and, and topics here on, on the stage that we're going to be discussing in the next, uh, I believe we still have about just under half an hour. So now, last but not least, um, I would like to turn to Falk Heinen from uh, the German Ministry of Environment. Mr. Heinen, how is Germany developing its thinking on addressing aviation's total climate impact? And to some extent, do you think that the uh, EU legislation that is currently um, under legislation, uh, can better address the aviation sector non-CO2 impact? Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, good afternoon to everybody and also good afternoon to my co-panelists. Um, in, in contrary to other panel discussions, I would like to start this, uh, this one with a personal statement because I'm now back in this uh, topic. And um, I started my career in the Federal Environmental Agency in Germany in 2001. And the first job I had was to deal with the IPCC Special Report on Aviation in the Global Atmosphere. And I did it over years, and I also negotiated in ICAO. And at that time, I remember clearly uh, this uh, typical diagram of the different bars with the effects of the different, um, of the different emissions from aviation. And uh, now I'm uh, looking back into the different reports. And we had a long debate during the years 2002-2003 about contraceptives. At that time, we had only a line, but now we have for a long time already a bar. And what was clear at that time, that once there's a bar, that we take, that we take measures. And now we're in 2022, and we have now the bar for a very long time, and actually we are further analyzing and nothing has happened. We also commissioned in 2007, the environment uh, ministry, a study on routing. 
2007 for the DLR made this. And there was also a good uh, discussion. We had great recommendations. Also here, we are still in the debate of analyzing and making studies. I think um, we have done a lot of things and now it's necessary also to take measures. So that's the end of my personal statement. And now I'm coming to the situation <laughs> in Germany. As you know, we have a new government and of course uh, the emissions from aviation and the effects on the atmosphere is of course very important also for the new government and we're dealing with that. What we do is that we of course, we, con we, we continue um, our work in context with ETS, also our work in ICAO in order to also uh, promote uh, work uh, to include the non-CO2 impacts. And the second issue we're dealing with, and uh, that's what we already made, while transposing uh, the RED2 international legislation, we um, included in, the, in our national greenhouse gas quota. So this is our system for reducing the climate impact of fuels. We included a mandatory subquota um, PTX for aviation as of 2026, 0.5% as of 2026. And this will increase until 2030 to 2%. And uh, we made a lot of analysis in that context. And we saw that this is possible. It's not necessary to wait longer. And this is also a collaboration together with industry. And therefore we had a national PTA roadmap together with industry, with the Bundesländer and all the other stakeholders in this field. Uh, what we also do is that we continue our work in context with routing. So to improve um, the trajectories in order to reduce climate impact uh, from aviation. Uh, further studies are ongoing. I think there's a lot of material already available in order to start a concrete measure to um, improve routing in order to prepare it. And of course, uh, we um, deal uh, with other uh, possibilities. We're dealing with, with NOx issues, but of course, contrast series is the key issue. In context with the uh, last uh, item you mentioned, uh, the um, Fit for 55 package and what can we do here? I think definitely it's necessary um, to use it and to think what is possible. We have to uh, further consider as to whether it's possible to include something in the UATS. And uh, also um, my colleague uh, from the UBA will report later about that. Um, then we have to deal with the refill aviation and to make it in a way, to design it in a way that really will help us also uh, to uh, make these effects, to, to reduce these effects. And of course, we have, and other speakers already mentioned that, we have to deal with the fuel quality. Currently, there's also ongoing the debate of the fuel quality directive as part of the RED2 deliberations in the council working groups. Maybe this is one place, but actually it should be possible also to limit uh, the aromat content in order to reduce the particulate formation and thus reduce consistorious uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Falk. Now, before we jump into the next question, I will allow for a quick round of reactions. So if anybody would want to react to any of the speaker's statements, you have up to one minute for a, uh, for a reaction statement. I'm not sure if uh, Mark, Magnus, Jutta, Falk would like to comment on anything specific, or we can move to the, to the next questions. Uh, just, right. just a very quick remark, mm -hmm. because um, one of the other speakers, I forgot to jot down the name, said, well, long it wasn't clear whether contrails are contributing to warming or to cooling. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 9-11 in 2001. And after 9-11, in the complete US, there were no flights. All flights would stay grounded for in a week or so. And the temperature at night dropped by one degree Celsius due to the absence of contrails. So, so that was a very good experiment to show what actually contrails do. And actually they, they do warm. It, it has been clear for more than 20 years now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Mark, if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, I, I just want to be clear. I was saying that with uncertainty, acknowledging uncertainty, the contrail effect is warming. It is net warming. Apologies if, if uh, that didn't come through clearly. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. And I think that fits very nicely to, to our, our next question, which is 
talking a little bit about the, the, the innovations and technology that we can expect and like how can we uh, better support it. So if I can stay with you, Mark, uh, for a second. Um, what promising developments are we seeing in the field of, of control avoidance in particular? So I, th I, <clears throat> I think there is a desire from many stakeholders within the industry to address non-CO2 and we have had a handful of trials uh, in the last couple of years. Um, that includes a trial led by Eurocontrol and DLR in the Maastricht air uh, airspace, which we will hopefully hear about. Um, on the science side, we are making progress with improving our models, understanding of the atmosphere and uncertainties related to meteorology. We're getting better at observing contrails using satellites um, and, and monitoring their effects. And we need to improve that. You know, as scientists, we, we, we definitely acknowledge that we need to improve that. But that is something that the scientific community is very aware of. I'm particularly excited by the fact that the industry is now engaged, and that means that scientists and in the industry can work together. So we need to have, you know, to understand those trade-offs that were mentioned between contrail avoidance and fuel consumption, but we need to understand what that trade-off is. And if we don't collaborate, we won't understand what the fuel penalty might be. Now, the point on that is that flights aren't fully optimized for fuel consumption. They are optimized for total cost. So there is some scope I think, um, to address contrails and at the same time not increase CO2. Um, but again, that, that has to be uh, established through transparency and collaboration. Um, I think the SAF's point is, is really interesting. It's been mentioned that it's a win-win. Um, I think we can be a bit more clever about how we deploy SAFs. And so we are at some preliminary analysis stage looking at how SAFs could be deployed at different blend ratios. You know, is it sensible to put it into all fuel at very, very low blend ratios, or could we target its use to um, flights which may have a larger uh, contrail warming effect? Um, so that's, I think, you know, really important work. We should be thinking about how we use this very constrained supply of alternative fuels, be it low aromatic fuels or sustainable aviation fuels, in a in a smarter way to address the non-CO2 effects um, as much as we can. Thanks, Mark. Magnus, what is one innovation or technology development to address non-CO2 effects that you're yeah, particularly excited about or looking forward to? Well, if you ask me to pick just one, I would have to pick uh, sustainable aviation fuels, simply because there, this is an area where we are quite confident that we have mutual benefits between CO2 and non-CO2 emissions. Um, we are not quite there yet on the re refuel EU proposal. Uh, Jutta Paulus mentioned that uh, she considers our ambition level in the proposal to be uh, not to be uh, high enough, uh, but I can also say that there are member states uh, in the council working group that take the opposing view that they are afraid of embarking on this uh, transition to uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So uh, all in all, probably we will both as, as the starting, uh, the percentages of blending at the start and who knows at the end, that's much more uncertain at today, but perhaps also uh, for the end, uh, the levels of the Commission proposal will, will uh, uh, prevail. But of course, uh, this is a uh, democratic process in, among the two uh, EU co-legislators and uh, that can change. What can also change on, on refuel EU proposal is the definition of SAF. Uh, there are a number of proposals to uh, mainly to include additional categories in the definition of SAF compared to the Commission proposal. So that's uh, something that we, uh, we still have to finalize those negotiations. Uh, but hopefully by the end of the year, that will be possible. For the other technologies, uh, I would have to say that uh, it might not be as clear that uh, they would provide potential uh, overall climate benefits. So 
uh, that's why my vote goes for uh, review Liu Aviation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, Itapaus, you might want to react to some of the aspects on, on Refuel EU. Yes, surely. I mean, um, I still don't know how we can be climate neutral with 37% of fossil fuels in aviation, but never mind. Um, what I think is really important is we are today already seeing the first pilot projects, it's a very literal word here, on electricity and hydrogen in aviation. Of course, this is at the very, very start, but I think that there is still a long way to go, but it could take off in the next decade. And there is a lot of potential because um, to be very honest, burning fossil fuel is not very efficient in the first place. So by um, using more efficient means of propulsion that could really bring the sector forward and also um, it has been mentioned the study that has been done by Deutsche Luft and Deutsche, um, Deutsche Zentrum für Luft und Raumfahrt and, Raumfahrt and um, the Maastricht people um, the study on the route selection so that not so many contracts are formed that I think is a very important intermediate measure until we manage to find a fuel where no contrails are formed in the first place. Thanks. Thank you. Last but not least, Falk, what do you think? Yes, uh, thank you very much again. And I would also like um, to touch upon the fuels. Of course, we have to continue our work in context with technical and operational measures. But I think uh, fuels are definitely the key opportunity to, the re to reduce uh, the um, climate change impact of aviation and thus also the non-CO2 effects. And um, as I said, we included um, in our national greenhouse gas quota, the um, PTX quota for um, aviation. Um, this will increase from 0.5% to 2% in 2030. And this is a key opportunity. And we made a lot of analysis in Germany about hydrogen. It's already, and it's well known also in the Brussels debate that we have a long history here in context with PTX. And we decided to put um, the uh, PTX, the refinables produced with additional renewable fuels in, uh, has no direct, uh, direct electric alternative. And this is aviation. And of course we need to produce it, but we made a lot of analysis what is possible in order to start and when is it possible? Uh, to start and we came to the conclusion that 2026 already is possible and we have now a lot of investments going on we started also in uh, northwestern germany with the first commercial installation on producing e-kerosene so it's really ongoing and all these activities are due to the mandatory mandatory quota um, in uh, the uh, greenhouse gas quota so national legislation with the current version of the refill aviation and therefore i would uh, say to martin Stislev, please be consequent also in that context. With the current version of the refuel aviation, we would need to change our national legislation to postpone the requirements to 2030. And I think um, now we have all the investments, everything is ongoing, and therefore we should be consequent. The uh, e-kerosene refinables in aviation can reduce the CO2 emissions, of course, and can further reduce non-CO2 effects due to the a better, a cleaner fuel, and a thus reduction of particulates. And therefore, I think um, we should be consequent in that way. We should uh, go the way forward with the um, alternative fuels, and in particular with the um, with refinables, because refinables, in contrary to um, to um, advanced biofuels, have unlimited punch potential. We need additional um, renewable sources with the biomass, like from uh, Annex 9, uh, Part A, uh, we have only a limited potential, but with refinables, we have really the unlimited potential and we, we should use this legislative uh, procedure uh, currently ongoing in order to uh, also reduce the uh, non-CO2 impacts uh, of aviation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are nearing the end of our first uh, first panel today. And I think an important question to ask is that there's a lot that we know now, but there's still a lot that we don't know. So how can how do you all think that Europe can better support the uptake of, of these innovations? We have 
under five minutes to go to to finish uh, this panel so i'm just going to give you all one minute each i know it's a challenge but that's uh, what sometimes these pitching exercises are about. So I think we can just like make a quick round on the opposite order that we uh, that we started. So if I can start with you again, Falk. Okay, thank you very much. I would start with um, the main uh, thinking about that. I think it's uh, better to be somewhat correct instead of definitely wrong. We know that we have the certainty that there's a, a warming effect due to the additional uh, effects and non-CO2 effects. And therefore, currently we know that these effects are available. I think there is a broad consensus and that there should be the opportunity to um, take the measure. And while improving the knowledge and to re while reducing the uncertainties of the different effects, it's possible to improve the measures. But we need to start. We need to start with the fuels. We need to start with the operational measures. And we need to start maybe at a slightly later point of time with um, included in the uh, ETS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heinen. Jutta Paulus. I mean, it is not enough, but <laughs> still, mm -hmm. what I said, I think the important thing is to send the sign to the industry that uh, the time to act is now. Sending the sign, you will have to provide um, so and so many few sustainable aviation fuels in 2025, and so and so many that of these must be synthetical aviation fuels. This is already possible to produce. I mean, I've spoken to quite a few stakeholders during the um, preparation of the, of the draft report. So they all said, we are ready to invest. We have tested our technology. It does work. We can produce synthetical aviation fuels, which of course, um, as the last mass of, on this planet is limited, are much more efficient than producing sustainable aviation fuels from biomass. So sending this sign to the industry now will, of course, spur the investment because we will not do away with aviation. I cannot imagine a world without aviation, even though I hardly fly myself, except for going to the US or something where there is hardly any other means available. But in order to be able to fly in a climate neutral world. We need some synthetic fuels and we need to start as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Jutta Paulus. Now, if I can turn to our in person, like our stage here, Magnus Gislev, have four minutes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, really look into all the um, potential measures that were identified in the updated an analysis by EASA not just refuel you, but the others, the others as well. We need to reduce their uncertainties, as was mentioned by Clara de la Torre and, and Patrick Key. Um, I would also to that add that for the time being, as we've discussed, we've been, we are focusing quite a lot on the refuel EU, uh, and hopefully we will have a blending mandate in, in force from 2025. Uh, but many of these issues are probably best addressed uh, at international level. And therefore, I would like to also highlight the fact that uh, ICAO is doing work on this in the context of the, uh, well, within the framework of the uh, Committee on Aviation and, and Environmental Protection and have four specific actions on this in the next uh, period. Uh, basically, that, that's everything we need to do as the EU. We need to, to refuel EU, EU aviation. We need to follow up on the other uh, policy, uh, potential policies identified, and we need to act in, internationally in ICAO. Slan Magnus, thank you very much. And last but not least, Mark, also from our researcher, from a scientific perspective, what do you think, what, what, what do you need as a researcher to, uh, to co continue on, on, on this research and like, to understand more? Uh, on the non-CO2 effects. So I'm, I'm not a policymaker, but it seems to me that there needs to be an incentive for action, um, and that will drive uh, associated industries, supporting industries, to also provide better data, meteorological forecasts that are improved, to innovate and in invest in improving the data required to you know, reduce uncertainties, make better accurates of contrails. In terms of the science, Science and industry really needs to go together in this. Every time we fly, we are forming, you know, have essentially doing an experiment. You know, does it form a contrail or not? Every time we put some staff into an aircraft, does it form a contrail or not? How long does that contrail last? And at the moment, as scientists, we don't have that information about fuel and 
proper flight trajectory data. Often we take you know, radar data or uh, ADSB GPS data and we piece, we piece together trajectories um, where we don't have data points. We also don't know the fuel composition of flights. So our understanding of how you know, specific flights lead to contrails is really not perfect. And we could reduce our uncertainties, improve accuracy if we have better information, more transparency. All right, so thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much to all of you. I think we could grasp, let's say, the many dimensions involved in, in, in this important topic. We've discussed many solutions, many potential potential pathways. What do we have? What do we still need um, in order to enact more legislation on, on, on these matters? There's been a common thread, I think. A lot of, uh, a lot of us we have been talking about, about fuels, and that's precisely what our next sessions are going to, to be about in the upcoming on the new technological developments. So, uh, make sure to to stay with us. Don't uh, don't miss the the next uh, next sessions. We have a few more technical questions also. Or for instance, con contrail uh, avoidance matters. But we're going to have also some more presentations on that. So we will probably be able to address the questions uh, later on. So uh, Falheinen, Jutta Paulus, Magnus Gislev, and Mark Sedler, thank you very much once again for for being with us this afternoon. All right, so we are heading towards the second part of our of our event this afternoon today because we're going to be talking about solutions, what different innovations, which different methods are being tested and researched to address non-CO2 emissions. We're going to have a slightly different format now. We're going to have a number of uh, five minutes presentations and you will be able to ask questions. So. Uh, once we reach our Q&A section, you can, uh, of course, uh, if you are in person here in Brussels, raise your hand. If you're online, again, uh, write down your question in the Q&A function, not the chat. Uh, so we will be able to take up as many questions as possible. So we're going to have two sections. Uh, we're going to have a coffee break in between at five minutes to four. Um, so we're going to start um, with the first session, with the first presentation on the climate impact of aromatics. And we're going to have with us Mr. Patrick Leclerc. He's the head of the department for multi-phase flow and alternative fuels at the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Uh, Mr. Leclerc, uh, I'm, with us. Um, I'm online. Can you hear me? We can hear you and we'll be very shortly be able to see you too, I believe. Yes, can you see the, the presentation? Just a not yet. We're having a small, just bear with us for a second, please. Uh -huh. uh, we, can see, we can see your presentation well now. Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick Leclerc, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor and uh, it's actually great to come after all those great present presenters and panelists. Uh, a lot of facts and information were given already, so I'm actually just going to put some figures and, and nice plots around the, the facts. Uh, first of all, um, if I can manage to get to the next slide. Um, excuse me. I have a technical issue. Can you hear me? But probably you can. Uh, yes, we can hear you well. Um, one second. Very sorry. I'm very sorry. I have a technical issue. It doesn't let me go from one slide to the next one. We, yeah. 
you probably have to skip to the screen of the presentation in order to be able to move it. So while you're in the Zoom screen, in the Zoom tab, so to speak, it doesn't move. Um, yeah, actually, the, the the control of the presentation is on this on a different uh, screen, and it it doesn't let me even on the on the keyboard. I can't I can't control it. I'm really sorry. Um, Hello, Patrick. Patrick. Maybe we can support. Well, yeah, you can hear you have, Patrick, do you have my presentation with you? Patrick, we're going to do the slides from here, so we can Thank skip, you very much. Uh, yeah. ourselves. Just let us know next slide, and we'll do it for you. This okay. is the choice of a hybrid event. Thank you for bearing with us. Yeah, slide number two. Thank you. Thank you. So um, first of all, I wanted to give just a, a, a brief overview about um, suit formation and the relation to contrails. So you have a, a, an engine with a combustor, um, this small area where the, the red arrow is pointing to. And the combustion process basically oxidizes the fuel into very small molecules, uh, mostly to 99.9% .9 you have CO2 altogether, CO2 and water, and then some uh, either soup particles or volatile and unborn, unborn uh, hydrocarbons. And then you have a, within the combustion chamber, you have uh, a process where uh, um, stable ring structure molecules start forming uh, soot. So this is what you see on the, on the very top. So at the exit of your combustor, you have those agglomerates of soot. It's basically carbon matter. It's, we call it non-volatile particle matter, or it's, it's black carbon. And it comes out, it's not uh, further reacting inside the, the, the high pressure turbine. And it comes out in the plume together with volatile particles as well. So they come out either as a, as a solid particle or as volatile, and then it mixes with the ambient air and condenses into water and then uh, ice crystals. And very, very important aspect here is that there are also particles in the ambient atmosphere that get entrained from this uh, plume. And which means that even if there was no soot coming out of the plume, you would still have ambient particles mixing in your plume and forming those so-called nucleation sites. So basically, uh, you, you, you have here a relationship between your fuel composition, the combustion process, the soot particles coming out of your engine and, and at high speed in the plume mixing with the environment, and then where water is condensing onto and then forming ice crystals. Now, under certain conditions, um, these will either not being uh, seen as, as ice crystals or being uh, long living uh, uh, contrails, which then triggers the formation of cirrus clouds or cirrus uh, contrails. And this is, this is key. It means that it's not just the contrails that you see in the sky that will uh, modify the radiative balance. It's the, the, the high cirrus clouds that cover a lar large surface area that will modify uh, the, the radiative balance, which are triggered by the, the contrails. Now, next slide, please. Uh, now, as I've, as I've mentioned, there is a relationship between your fuel composition and the contrails. Now, if you look at the fuel composition, uh, what you see first is a safety range. When, when you, whether it's a conventional fuel or a SAF, uh, you need to be within a, a certain uh, safety range. And these, this is called the specification. So you have requirements that needs to be fulfilled by the, the fuel in terms of properties. And here I just took an extract from the, the standard, which is the, the amount of, of aromatics. And you have here, for conventional fuel, just a maximum limit. There is no minimum limit. Uh, the minimum limit comes into play just with the SAFs that were um, approved so far. That's the second uh, standard that you see here on the bottom left. And the, the minimum is 8%. Um, once it's, uh, it's mixed with, uh, with, blended with the conventional fuel. Um, so, but this does not mean that you know exactly what's in the fuel in your, in your aircraft. So 
On the other side, you have a safety check. Every batch of fuel that's produced at the refinery comes out with a certificate of analysis or certificate of quality. And there you need, you see that it fulfills all the, speci all the specification requirements. But again, this fuel batch will be mixed at the, at the tank, at the airport tank. And so you, don't, you never know exactly what's in your aircraft. And I think it was mentioned uh, uh, before, and that's a very important uh, aspect. It was mentioned by uh, uh, Mark, um, that you know, you, we need to implement this type of monitoring so that we could see, okay, first of all, what's the direct effect? And then maybe uh, gather many aspects of the physical and chemical properties of the fuel and see their effect on the, on the suit and then on the contrail. So again, here, the safety range and the safety check is not exactly what you have there in, in your aircraft and is not directly related to your in-flight performance and emissions. So here in the, in the digital era, we need to monitor that, to gather all this data, at least for, for uh, Europe, to start monitoring these effects. Next slide, please. Um, here is one example of a, a flight campaign and, and ground measurement campaign that we uh, performed uh, to show that the aromatic content of the fuel does uh, correlate with the soot emission, but it's not the perfect parameter. For example, here you have different fuels. On the right, on the left of your plot, you have a fully synthetic jet fuel, then you have semi synthetic jet fuels, and then you have the references, which are conventional fuels. And you see that it's not just a straight line. Next slide, please. So if we use the H2C ratio, it's basically the, the hydrogen content of your, of your fuel. It, it, it is more of a straight line. So this is a better parameter. However, the problem is this information is not given in the certificate of quality. So maybe that's one of the first measures. Try to have more information about the chemical uh, composition and the physical properties of your fuel that are listed uh, so that we can correlate better with the soot emission. But we see here that with the reduction or the increase in your hydrogen content, you have up to 70% reduction in your uh, particulate emissions, the non-volatile particulate emissions. Next slide, please. So here is a list of some of the measurement campaigns that we performed that we were part of. For example, access in 2014 with NASA, and we, it was demonstrated that the use of HEFA fuels, so it's a, it's a SAF, uh, can reduce up to 50% the soot emission. And then you had the ECLIF, Emission and Climate Impact uh, Measurement Campaign, the one and two, 2015 and 18, uh, also with uh, partners such as NASA and R NRC and, and FAA. And here, very importantly, it was demonstrated for the first time the, rela the direct relationship between a soot reduction due to the use of SAF, for example, or semi-synthetic jet fuel, and the reduction in ice crystal concentration in the contrails. So this is, this is the, the key, so that we have a direct link between your fuel and the climate impact through the contrails. And then lately in 2021, with the Airbus, Rolls-Royce, and uh, Neste, we performed 100% SAF, because I think, and it was mentioned before, this is the, this is the future. We need to go towards 100% SAF, and best of all would be 100% synthetic paraffinic kerosene, so without any aromatics. Next slide, please. So again, here is just to put figures on what was said before. Uh, I think it was mentioned by uh, Mark Stettler. Um, you see on the left-hand side, uh, the overall uh, climate impact of aviation and specifically CO2 and non-CO2 effect. And you see the air bars. And I think that was also a big discussion point. You see that for CO2 effect, so it's the second line, um, you have a small air bar or uncertainty bar with respect to the contrail. But still, again, it was said, it's, it's in the red. So it's, it's warming, it's a warming effect. The, the, the blue zone is, uh, the blue bar is a, is a cooling effect, but the red is a, is a warming effect. So you overall, you have a warming effect. And I think we need to reduce this uncertainty, but we also need to start action based on the fact that it exists. It is there. Um, now, there was a further study by my colleagues at the DLR from uh, uh, um, the Institute of Atmospheric Physics, which showed that if you use a fuel which can reduce up to 80% uh, the soot emission, and that's not science fiction, it, it is possible, then you have up to a decrease of 50% of the radiative forcing. And you see here on, the, on the, this map, 
uh, in the, the different flight routes that um, it's it's the, the blue areas are where it's it brings a real difference compared to a, a standard case uh, in terms of uh, reducing this warming effect. So, and one very important aspect is that these non-CO2 effects don't have the same time scale as the CO2 effect. The CO2 in the atmosphere takes between 50 to 200 years to really get processed and, and reduced. Whereas if you reduce the non-CO2 effect, it's, it's immediate, whether it's uh, rerouting using SAF and all that in a smart way, getting the information and then applying it to the specific routes and specific airports with the dedicated infrastructure for, for SAF. Final slide, please, thank you. So in conclusion, uh, we've demonstrated that the jet fuel's composition has direct effect through its properties on control formation and the aviation total uh, climate impact. Now, we advise maybe not to consider only the aromatic content, but several physical as well as chemical properties of the fuel um, so that we can estimate in a better way and then maybe uh, use that in, in uh, um, in this, this framework of European uh, um, use of SAF and rerouting um, and, and um, assess the control uh, impact. Now, overall, um, and it was mentioned before, I think uh, monitoring and gathering all the data is, is going to be key uh, so that whether it's for scientists or for agencies implementing policies, they need to know at each point of time and space what fuel was used and with from which airline for which uh, line and, and flight so that we can gather all this data, process the data, and then finalize the, the implementation of these measures. And then uh, same with the, the monitoring of climate impact. I think we need to start this, this monitoring because it's, it's, I think we've demonstrated that non CO2 effects are a fact. Now we need, if we implement policies, we need to monitor the effect. Um, so that, that's, these are the, the messages. Thank you very much. And again, sorry for the technical problem initially. No problem. Thank you, Leclerc, -Lec, for, uh, yeah, for, for being with us, for, for your presentation, and also to the audience for, for your patience. Despite this uh, technical, small technical hiccups, we're still getting used to this uh, hybrid environment uh, in, in our conferences. So uh, next up is uh, Mr. Alain Quignard. He's a fuels, biofuels and conversion expert at IFPEN. He will talk to us about how to reduce aromatics from jet fuels. So Mr. Quignard, thank you for being with us. And if we could kindly ask you to stick to the, to the timing. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Just waiting for the slides mm -hmm. should be able to see you shortly here on on stage um okay that's fine for me second can I here start? you are yes here you are thanks a okay lot. thank you <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting summit organized by government this is a key question uh, non co2 effect and i, I will emphasize on how it could decrease sulfur and aromatic in jet fuel and especially in fossil jet fuel. Next slide, please. So I, I would very quickly uh, present a jet fuel survey, then uh, a slide uh, just to uh, describe what could be uh, done in a refinery to decrease sulfur and aromatics. And the heart of the uh, topic is uh, how to describe and aromatize fluids. Uh, before conclude, uh, I would just remind uh, uh, what are the SAF routes and what could be uh, the help of SAF to reduce sulfur aromatics. Next slide, please. So uh, I take the example of this uh, quite old 2006 CRC survey, but it remains very interesting because the specification of jet fuels are remaining the same. So this survey is very interesting because uh, 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 we have a very large range of characteristic and chemical composition uh, related to different types of civil and military jets. So mainly from North America and Europe, but also from other countries. Next slide, please. So 
uh, just regarding uh, the sulf sulfur is at an average of between 400 and 600 ppm, depending on the uh, jet type, with a maximum of uh, 2,500. So well below the specification. And the survey is in line with another survey uh, performed in 2013 called PQEIS. Okay. Uh, just, uh, okay, thank you. Regarding the aromatic, uh, the average is close to 17, 18%. Uh, and with a uh, minimum aromatics uh, a little bit higher than 12, 10%. Regarding diaromatics and naphthalines, the average is within the 1 to 1.5 range, with maximum close to 2.5, 3.5%, depending on the jet time. Next slide. Uh, no, uh, can you uh, show the next one, please? Not, not this one, but the next one. Next, please. Ah, sorry for the animation. <laughs> uh, next, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, this is uh, the example of deconversion refinery. Uh, currently, today, uh, the, the most uh, used uh, refining tools to reduce sulfur in jet fuel is based on uh, light desulfurization called sweetening in order to decrease mercaptan's uh, in the jet fuels, or we can use uh, desulfurization. Uh, uh, this is the main uh, refining tools used to produce uh, jet today, and the composition of the product is very similar to the composition within the crude. We have no chemical structure modification. The other uh, next, yes, the other refining tool quite used. Uh, in a refining is the so-called hard cracker. It's a uh, hard cracking at high pressure and uh, high with hydrogen and high temperature. Uh, and and uh, the hard cracking the hard cracker will modify quite a lot the chemical structure of the product towards many saturates, normal and high paraffins, monosacroalkanes, with a pretty low aromatic content uh, with relation to the crude oil. So, next slide. So, uh, regarding desulfurization, uh, this uh, Desulfurization of jet fuel down to 10 or 100 ppm is quite easy because we can use conventional uh, HGS catalyst used for gas, gas soil hydro treatment. The chemical structure is not change. We have a very low hydrogenation of the aromatics, naphthalines, no hydrogenation of monoaromatics, and resulting in uh, almost no more hydrogen consumption uh, than for conventional refining. Next slide, please. So as remind today, uh, we have uh, aromatic is uh, specified at a high, uh, maximum level in D1655, but regarding SAF, uh, ASTM D7566, we have at least more than 8% of aromatics has uh, discussed in, in the final blends. So we can see that uh, the aromatization from about 20% down to 8% is not quite right today but it's feasible with hydro cracking or deep hydro treatment. We should use more civil uh, hydro treatment and hydro cracking uh, conditions. The full hydrogenation of naphthalene will perform and with a significant hydrogen consumption uh, up to 0.5 to 1 person, uh, white person. Next slide, please. So regarding the aromatization at much lower level, uh, below five, eight persons is technically feasible, but using very civil condition and dedicated processes. That can be, uh, be either uh, hydrodiarmatization and dewaxing in order to improve cold flow properties or a dedicated two-step hydro cracking with a high hydrogen consumption, higher than one person. You can see on the right hand side, on the bottom figures, that uh, if first step hydrocracking can be used 
to reduce up to 8% harmonics, we need dedicated hydrocracking or hydrodermatization at lower level. And we have a pretty good correlation between hydrogen content or H open C ratio and aromatic content. Next slide, please. So just a very short uh, view regarding SAF, you know that we have currently in this 7560, seven SAF route yet certified. And next, please. Uh, and uh, most of the SAF have a very low aromatic content and no sulfur. So uh, it, uh, next. It means that a blending up to 50% SAF with zero aromatics with an average SAF fossil fuel at 70 aromatic contents, it is possible uh, to decrease down to 8 to 9% just by blending. So this is one part of the solution. Next slide, please. To conclude, so decreasing aromatic uh, down to 10% is possible through existing refining, through uh, with one minor revamping, but with higher consumption. Decreasing it at lower level is technically possible, but with uh, much more difficult from technical position, we need specific uh, refining tools with a higher hydrogen consumption. Next. Uh, so use of, of SAF wheel. And what is very important, which has been discussed yet, is we need more study to understand the relationship between chemical structure, aromatic and cycloalkylene content uh, versus design of performance of polymers in, uh, using seals. Uh, and we also need much more studies uh, in partnership to understand fuel chemical structure versus impact on emissions such as particles, but also contrails. So next. So just to conclude, uh, we there is have uh, quite a lot of project, uh, cooperative project uh, we, we were involved in IPN uh, at U national and European uh, level. Uh, on SAF, but I guess we need more. Thank you very much. Right. Mr. Kenya, thank you very much for your presentation, for, for being with us and talk to us through a little bit how to be reducing aromatics on, on, on jet fuel. I think a lot of food for thought and many questions that will be coming up from the stage. So, um, last but not least, before we move to a Q&A and, and then to a much expected coffee break, uh, next time it's uh, joining with us on stage Valérie Guénon. She's Vice President for Products and Environment Policy at Safran. She will speak to us about how to run an engine on 100% SAF or lower aromatic. So thank you very much, Valérie, for being with us. This here? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so last before the coffee break, I yeah, try to <clears throat> speak for no more than five minutes. It's quite a challenge. Um, so um, yes, well, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of the Safran Group, um, aircraft and engine equipments. Uh, so for us, yes, it is critical to address non-CO2 effects. It's critical, and it has been critical for many years, for decades actually. Um, and uh, in order for us, we need to define our priorities in research and technology and to propose optimized solutions. We are not allowed to uh, be wrong. Uh, we have the obligation to do it right uh, and to be on the right track. So really understanding and quantifying uh, all the very complex mechanisms on non-CO2 emissions is really key. Uh, regarding solutions, so um, I will speak first about a research project, uh, which is, well, um, Mr. Leclerc has mentioned a research pro project called ECLIF. I'm going to speak about a research project called Volcan. It's a French uh, research project, quite similar actually, because um, we flew an aircraft. It's a, research, a French research project led by Airbus. And we flew an A319, um, uh, 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 sorry, with LEAP engines, with our, our, our engines, and we measure behind the uh, aircraft flying, we measure the emissions that come out of the 
um, engines, uh, so uh, the polluting, the pollutants, and the ice crystals. Um, so the first campaign has been performed uh, uh, end of last year. Um, and a second campaign will take place this year, so you don't have to be patient to have the final results and publication, but I can al already mention that uh, there are some prom promising results that do confirm the fact that, um, well, I forgot to say that the tests were made with 100% paraffinic uh, fuel, uh, SAF, which means 0% aromatic. So there is a link between reducing the aromatics and reducing the number, the, the, the amount of soot. So there are promising results. Um, so um, regarding the, as an aircraft engine and equipment manufacturer, we also in this uh, project not only have to measure what comes out of the, um, you know, the emissions that come out, but also how this fuel interacts with our systems. Uh, so that's where uh, Saffron Group companies uh, are participating. So uh, the systems, uh, we have, uh, you saw a picture of, of an aircraft engine shown previously by the DLR, and you saw the combustor. So the combustor is this very critical component of the uh, engine, this is where the fuel is burned. So we, we know we, f we burn the fuel to provide the energy for, for, uh, for the thrust. Um, and in this combustor, um, it's, it's like hell in there with the temperature, with the, the constraints, mechanical vibration constraints, and yet we have to control very precisely a set of very complex parameters that ensure the, um, the, the operability, the reliability and the efficiency of this uh, combustor. And it's absolutely key. It's also key for safety, of course. And it is also the combustor that we have to minimize. This is where NOx and particulates are created. So this, this is also where we work in order to minimize those emissions. So when we're going to change the fuel and really working with a 0% aromatic fuel means really like a new fuel. And this new fuel has a different chemical composition, but it also has different physical properties. And this was also mentioned by my colleagues before. And so those different physical properties are going to have an influence on, you know, the, the, uh, they ha it's a different density, uh, lubricity, the spraying properties, all this has to be very carefully assessed. How is this fuel going to change? What's going on in this combustor? But then next, we, not, we do not only use the fuel for burning, we also use the fuel for other functions, such as, such as actuation or cooling. Uh, so, um, it, well, the effect of the fuel on the seals has been mentioned, so this is definitely something we have to assess. And we have to assess, so this fuel, makes its way in all of our systems and that's the reason why in this research project we work also with other so saffron aircraft engines saffron um, landing systems uh, uh, saffron um, aero systems and saffron um, filtration systems it's convenient because well i said saffron several times that i also mentioned what these companies do and what equipments they work on uh, so, um, well, about reducing aromatics, we strongly believe that it is a very promising, that it has a very strong potential for reducing the pollutants, for also reducing slightly the CO2, uh, and, um, and, prob and probably reducing the contrails. I say probably because all what has been said before indicates that there is still a lot to understand. It is still not fully uh, understood the mechanism of contrail formation or not totally understood, so this uh, work needs to continue on that. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, this is to um, indicate that whatever these future fuels will be, we will have to go through a very strong set of validation to validate what happens in the long term, in the repetition. It's not, we have an experience of decades with jet fuel. We have designed all of our systems according to the properties of jet fuel. So getting to a new fuel is going to require 
a lot of validation and also to work with the variability of the fuels. What do we do when we change fuels? What happens there? And uh, finally, of course, this is necessary for operations, but of obviously for safety of the flights. Uh, so not many solutions, more questions than solutions, but uh, we definitely support the research that has to be uh, uh, made uh, in the next, uh, in the coming years. Thank you for your attention and have a good coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Valerie, in fact, if I may ask you to stay uh, for, for a couple of minutes with, with us, because we don't have the coffee break just yet. We still have uh, 10 minutes for a short uh, Q&A based on, on the presentations that we have uh, just had. So, uh, yes, maybe that would be best if you could take like, one of the seats, maybe here on, on, on the center. That'd be great. Super. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's, uh, it's, it's, co it's coming really soon. So, um, I mean, at this stage, you know the drill. So if you have any questions, um, those who are in, in Brussels in person, you can uh, raise your hands and I will uh, look at you. And uh, for those um, being on Zoom, you can send your questions online. The questions will be getting through me from my phone. So if you see me here on my phone, I'm not on Instagram. I'm just browsing your questions. Um, so we have two first questions coming uh, online uh, based on this uh, first round of presentations. So first of all, we have one from Sally Cairns. She's asking that um, demand management is one approach to reduce non-CO2 emissions. So what role might uh, demand management uh, play? So I'm sure if maybe uh, DLR would be able to, to say this if uh, Patrick is online with us or, or, uh, or maybe uh, Valérie also would want to jump in. A demand management, I'm not sure it's kind of a fuel demand or, um, yeah, would, would you like to, to, to say a few words, perhaps, Valerie or um, Patrick, would you like to, to jump in? Passenger, passenger demand, eh? yes, sir. So I understand the, the question as passenger demand for, yes, uh, for sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, yes, as uh, passenger demand is one approach to reduce non-CO2 emissions. Um, yeah, it's a vast question. That, that, that's I think, what place says, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear you well. Um, I, it's not directly the answer, but uh, it's the, the point is, and that's a personal opinion, but I, I'm sure many of us share that opinion. Um, the, overall, it will be more expensive to fly in a uh, sustainable way, whether it's the fuel, whether it's it's later on new propulsion technologies, um, and this is this is basically what the society has to accept. So yes, passenger will have either in an active way or you know in a in a less transparent way where it's through the airline, but will have to 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 make a conscious choice that they pick this airline with a more expensive uh, fuel to fly uh, more sustainably. I think that's uh, that's the, the, one of the key messages. Mm -hmm. Right, Valerie, uh, any comments? Okay, uh, is it working? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with the, what Patrick said. Uh, uh, how can we act? Well, uh, I, I think that acting on the cost of the traffic, uh, of the, on the cost of the travel, sorry, uh, will be the most efficient way and we will see that there will be some effect maybe on the passenger demand. But uh, as in industry, what can we do? So whatever the passenger demand is, we have to provide um, uh, uh, you know, uh, if fuel efficient and 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 uh, CO2 efficient uh, travel, whatever the demand is. So we don't have, as as an industry, we don't have the lever on that. It's policy levers, uh, but I, I I believe that the lever of the cost will be the most efficient, certainly. And it's not on purpose. It's simply because SAF are going to be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have a second question online this time from Karsten Kapion. Do we know if it's better to use hydrogen for trading fossil or producing SAF? And how do we decide? Maybe uh, Alain will want to take this one? Yes, okay. So it, 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 it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, it, it's much more easier to use hydrogen as it is used in refinery to improve a little bit uh, 
fossil jet fuel characteristic, uh, such as decreasing aromatics. Uh, yeah, the cost uh, is significant, but it will be much less expensive that uh, synthesizing uh, SAF from uh, hydrogen, for example. But uh, for the future, if we succeed in decreasing the cost of renewable hydrogen, uh, it, it could be uh, an interesting way to, to, to decrease you. But today, as a transition, the best is to uh, use, uh, to probably to refine uh, the jet fuel with uh, less aromatics and sulfur, and also little by little to increase uh, incorporation. Excellent, thank you very much. I don't know if we have any questions from uh, a member joining in from Brussels. We can take one question over here. Please make sure to, uh, you know, uh, be uh, brief and to the point. And if you can state also your yeah your name and affiliation, of course. Um, thank you, Eduardo Maria from Mishka. There were a few mentions through your presentations and uh, on the relationship between reducing aromatics and engine seals. And I know this is an area that I think more research is needed into, but if, to the best of your knowledge, you could explain what removing aromatics could be, what the effect could be on these engine seals. Mm -hmm. Are you addressing any question, the question to any of the speakers in particular? I think Valerie mentioned it. I think there was another mention, but I forgot what that was. So the relationship between reducing aromatics and engine seals. Reducing, the relationship between reducing aromatics and engine? And the, the seals of the engines. The, I think it was seals. I think... Uh, did I get that wrong? Seals? Se seals, seals, engine seals. I think it's the a component rings, of the engine. The O-rings in the whole fuel system. Ah, uh, seals. The, yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay, sorry. I was thinking of CO, you know, uh, of <laughs> carbon oxide. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so your question is about the effect on seals, of, of reducing aromatics on seals? Okay. Uh, yes, um, the risk with reducing aromatics is that uh, the seals, uh, well, the seals, uh, they, they uh, swell, uh, and so they ensure uh, that there is no leak. So the problem is that with reducing the aromatics, it, this is thanks to the aromatics, and so reducing aromatics um, increases the fact that there will be leaks. So we just cannot afford that, of course. So. Um, uh, the challenge here is going to find um, seal, new seals uh, materials and our experts believe that it is possible. We will find seal materials that are compatible with a different type of, of different chemistry. Then the question, the, the next risk, which is more tricky, is how are we going to operate if we change fuel? So that, that's the question, uh, and I have no answer yet. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much. We have uh, one uh, last question uh, coming up uh, online, this one from uh, Jeppe Yul. Uh, just, us... could, oh, maybe yes, can course, I add sorry. something? Yes, definitely, Alan, please. Just uh, relating to the chemical structure of SAF, uh, I guess uh, we don't know so much cycloalkan behavior. But uh, in the future, uh, in the past, we made an IPN study with high cycloalkane jet fuel. It was from uh, coal liquefaction. And uh, uh, cycloalkane can, can be quite interesting regarding uh, seals because it can maybe solve uh, the, the, the trouble uh, from uh, fully paraffinic jet fuel. So there is also maybe possibility playing on the structure of the synthetic uh, fuel. Excellent. Patrick, uh, do you have your hand raised? I'm not sure if you wanted to add something. Yes, just a couple of comments. First of all, uh, when you have a new aircraft, new engine uh, with the new seals, you don't need the aromatics to have the seals, the O-rings sealing the whole fuel system. So that's the first point. So it's, it's something that comes after time. Now, modern aircraft using more like fluorosilicone uh, O-rings uh, are less sensitive, far less sensitive. And this is why the project that Valérie was mentioning 
as well as the eCliff project, they first looked at the fuel system of modern engine and modern aircraft and, and using 100% SAP, so SPK, no aromatics, and it is feasible. The problem will be with legacy, the so-called legacy aircraft. So we don't wanna, obviously in everything that was said today, every speech comes safety first. So this will be definitely an issue, but for, with modern engine, modern aircraft, it's not an issue anymore. We have the, the material and the procedure so that you can run on 100% on SPK. All right, I think it's high time for our well-earned coffee break. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are still like uh, some outstanding questions, so I'm sure that our speakers will be happy to address those uh, privately or those online questions. Perhaps we can address them uh, in writing, but uh, uh, yeah, time for, time for a little break. We are back in 15 minutes, so at 20 past four, is that correct? That's 20 past four. Central European time, we're going to be back. So thanks a lot to all of you for your time. Thank you for very your much, attention, everyone, for your interest. Bye-bye. Enjoy the coffee break.
All right, so right, if, if I may have everyone's attention for a second, please. Um, we're starting again in three minutes. We're starting again in three minutes. So if I can ask you to start taking your seats, please. Hi, thank you, thanks. Right. Uh, yes, you can. Um, I mean, if, if, if
Excellent. So, um, if I may have everyone's, everyone's attention in the room, please. Yes, we can start sitting down. Um, please. Please. Uh, we're, we're starting now. Um, so thank you very much to all of us. Hope you've enjoyed the, the coffee, coffee break. We're moving to our second round of uh, uh, of presentations. So uh, we're going to have now a presentation on a pilot project on control avoidance and monitoring tech. So we're going to have with us Laurent Lalouc, he's information manager for eco-friendly aircraft at Thales, and Guillaume Bernot, he's a deputy CEO of operations quality at Amelia, who will uh, tell us more about uh, their project. So if I may have Laurent and Guillaume online, are they with us? Yes, we are. Yes, we do. All right, we can see uh, Guillaume. Hassan, are you, are you with us? Hello. Hi, we can, we can hear you well now. Excellent. Okay. okay. If, where is yours? Uh, so can you see the slides OK? Yes, we can. OK, so with Guillaume today, uh, we're going to give you a talk about uh, more eco-friendly flights and what we intend to do both uh, from Amelia sites and uh, Dallas Avionics sites. So uh, we're going to give you a talk about uh, what we have in mind for uh, eco-friendly flights, and we will make a focus on the Dallas product, which is called uh, Flight Footprint Estimator. And then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about country forecast. Then we will go to the operation size with sites with uh, Amelia Green Initiative and Eco Roots in operation. And uh, we will end the, the discussion with the lovers and example of examination we, we intend to put into the field. So uh, our plan is to, uh, to make eco-friendly flight, flight uh, just like a continuous improvement process just like everything uh, is done in, uh, in aviation such as uh, safety. So to do this, we have uh, four, uh, four steps. Uh, number one is to uh, measure objectively uh, how much of flight impacts uh, the, the climate. Number two is to simulate and forecast and uh, try uh, to uh, consider uh, a set of routes and then uh, optimize in a, in a given uh, dimensions and make recommendation to the airlines and then execute it in the field, both on uh, the pilot side and the air traffic controller side. And then you re-enter the loop. So flight footprint is about uh, number one. And after we will give you a little bit of talk about uh, uh, forecast about contrail. And then we will see levers on uh, uh, the pillar number three uh, to optimize. And uh, Guillaume will uh, give you a talk about uh, execution in the real life. Um, so what is Flight Footprint? So Flight Footprint is a tool uh, for a given day, uh, at a given time, uh, for a given trajectory, gives you the impact of this flight uh, on the climate. And uh, it gives you this impact, of course, in CO2 regarding a fuel burn, but also in a CO2 equivalent uh, regarding all the greenhouse gases, uh, be it uh, nitrogen oxides or contrails. And uh, it even goes one step further uh, in, uh, the, um, in the cause to consequence chain by giving you an average temperature response for uh, a given flight or a given portion of flight uh, in pico Kelvin. So it could be warming or it could be cooling, but most of the time, as he was said, this is warming. warming. Okay. Um, and so what we want to do and our ambition is to reduce, of course, fuel consumption by 10% by playing on levers such as uh, wind surfing or continuous climb or continuous descent. Uh, but we, if we consider all the, the effects uh, up to uh, uh, nitrogen oxides and contrails, we could reduce up to 70% the CO2 equivalent. And that's more or less our ambition. Um, and so the benefits of that is that, of course, you could perform fuel savings. Of course, you can uh, claim carbon offsetting reduction. Uh, but as today, 
uh, non-CO2 are not, not eligible to taxes or uh, carbon offsetting, uh, you can value your, uh, your position as a sustainable leader. You can boost your transition as an airline and uh, you could engage, engage passengers B2B, et cetera. And as it was also said, uh, avoiding non-CO2 effects, it does not go in the same, in the same uh, mean as uh, CO2 effects. And therefore you will need some extra fuel burn, burn to avoid climate sensitive area. And uh, uh, flight footprints help you solve uh, this dilemma by setting a target uh, on extra fuel burn to save uh, some uh, um, uh, climate impact, okay? And so you could claim those uh, benefits regarding your ESG politics or your B2B or B2C uh, communication. And in the future, we hope uh, for claiming a green finance benefits and uh, maybe for a course, yeah. So in a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell, uh, flight footprints uh, detects what we call the big hits. So the big hits are the, the biggest, uh, the, the flights with the routes that uh, crashes the atmosphere, the, the most uh, crushing one. Uh, it's, uh, it makes uh, some forecasts for climate footprint. Uh, you could uh, gather uh, a climate footprint database you can uh, compute on a flight or a segment of flight or per batch of flight if you are an air traffic controller and you want to know the, the impact of your airspace. And as it is APIs, it, is, it could be connected to your IT uh, as you want it. Now, if we talk about contrails, we implemented the state of the art uh, science uh, to, uh, to, uh, to forecast those contrails. So this is an illustration of two different uh, flight level uh, where uh, you have, so the, the blue areas are contrail prone area. This means that if you go in this area, uh, your aircraft will do some persistent contrails. Uh, and as you can see, if you change your uh, flight level, uh, you, you could avoid those uh, contrails area. So this is one lever we want uh, to explore uh, with uh, flight footprints. So now in action, uh, Guillaume, your turn. Yes, thank you, Laurent. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I am Guillaume. I am a head of compliance of uh, Amelia. Uh, we are a small... Uh, uh, aviation company based in France. We are flying for uh, uh, regional cities uh, in Europe. And then in 2021, we launched uh, an internal initiative. We call that uh, Amelia Green. And then we, we are studying, we are putting in place short, mid and long-term projects. And we took some decision to reduce our impact on the uh, environment. Uh, then uh, currently we have uh, four uh, different uh, projects on the way. Uh, the first one is uh, what we call in French uh, bilan carbone. This is a, a project to evaluate uh, our carbon footprint as a company because uh, we have many entities. Some uh, are airlines, other ones are uh, MRO, maintenance repair and overall centers. So we have launched this project to evaluate our overall uh, bilan carbon, carbon footprint. Then we are also uh, studying our ISO uh, certification uh, just after our uh, bilan carbon. And then uh, what we are talking right now, we have uh, a contract with Thales uh, to use uh, their FFP estimator tools. So this is still uh, in development uh, with them. And then the last, uh, let's say, long-term project is uh, uh, exploration of uh, hydrogen uh, uh, energizing our aircraft. We have signed a, a MOU with a, a universal hydrogen to buy some uh, modification kits for our ATR fleet. So as you can see, uh, for us, uh, fly uh, greener is uh, really a short, mid, and long-term project. This is step-by-step -step, uh, uh, initiative. 
the next slide. So concerning the echo routes for uh, Amelia operation. So uh, we will use a Thales FFP estimator as echo route definition tool for all our fleets, our ATR, our Embraer, and also our Airbus with two uh, main uh, uh, aim. Uh, we will use FFP estimator to better identify the best possible echo routes when we are doing a route study. And then we will be able to uh, request uh, for quotation and DSP with the best possible option. And we will also show to our customer, to our clients, to our prospects, which is the impact on their choice. Because as, as we said before, we are sure that the customer has to pay to fly greener. And then the second goal is to optimize our daily routes, because we are also convinced that to fly greener, this is a day by day uh, tool, a day by day uh, culture dissemination inside our company. Because uh, we saw that we have a lot of information coming from scientists, coming from the manufacturer, but we really need to have a daily tool for our operation agents and also pilots. And we are quite sure that uh, FFP estimator is a good, a good tool to be integrated in the daily uh, operation Amelia reporter tool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, and so we we played with uh, flight footprint on uh, uh, some uh, uh, Amelia flights, uh, namely uh, Paris Tarbes and uh, Paris Valladolid. And uh, so we computed the impact. And uh, as you can see, it's no big surprise, but uh, the, it's uh, about uh, half and half uh, on uh, CO2 and non-CO2 uh, with uh, uh, nitrogen oxides and countries and uh, so we computed the, the contrail distance and the, the impact in GWP 100, which is the unit of the Paris Agreement. Uh, but uh, that's no uh, big surprise, I would say. But in the real life, it's it's uh, it's real. And uh, uh, and so also we uh, we uh, tried to find some big hits. And uh, so if you see the uh, statistical distribution of those uh, flights, you see that it's a rather large uh, distribution. And therefore, we don't need to reroute all the flights, we think. We think we, if we reroute only the big hits, when it's, it, it's already a, a huge improvement. And uh, if we take the Paris uh, Valladolid example, you see in GWP 100, you could double uh, this, uh, this number. Uh, by considering the, the flight with no countries and the flight with uh, a, a huge amount of countries. So how to avoid those, uh, those countries area? One lever is to change altitude, as it was said uh, by Patrick Key. And uh, uh, here you see we have the, the, the flight that was flown in blue. And if we change the altitude uh, in, uh, in orange, this is the fuel burn. So the higher you are, the lower the fuel burn, uh, this is standard. Uh, but for uh, non-CO2, so here it's the GWP and here it's the average temperature response, you see that we have a, a maximum above on a flight level of 330 to 360. If you go higher, then uh, you, you have, uh, uh, it's, it's lowering, but those levels are, are not accessible uh, due to uh, um, regulations. But if you fly lower here, you have a, a, a sweet spot where you have a low uh, non-CO2 impact and an affordable uh, fuel burn. And this is typically uh, the, 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 the kind of trade-off we could consider on, uh, on real flights uh, in the real life. I'm pretty much done with uh, what we wanted to, uh, to show it to you uh, today. I just want Thank to you. add something, if you don't mind, regarding SAF, because I heard uh, all the discussion about SAF uh, from, uh, let's say, a small regional airline perspective. Uh, we have two questions about SAF. For sure, the first one is the price, because this is five, six times higher than current fuel. So it's, for the time being, 
uh, a complete a complete change of our business model because the price is so high currently that this is quite difficult to integrate SAF in the current business model. And then the second question is also the availability of the SAF in uh, small or isolated airports, even in France. Currently, this is quite impossible to find SAF available to fill the, the tanks. So two, two questions regarding SAF, cost and availability. Thank you. Perfect, Guillaume Laurent, thank you very much for your presentations. All right, so continuing on, on the solutions and particularly on the issue of corn trail uh, mitigation. Now, I'm delighted to have uh, with us here today Ilona Sitova. She's a strategy and performance management, uh, strategy and performance management at the Maastricht Upper Area Control Center, where she's going to tell us what's about control avoidance in practice. So, Ilona, the floor is yours. Uh, we is it, is it activated? Should be you should be able uh, to, to hear well, yes. Doesn't seem to be working. No. And then I can use this microphone. Can can you start with with the with the the microphone? That microphone. Yes, please, Silona. Thanks. Now, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Ilona Sitova, I'm from MUAC, and we, I'm going to inform you about the first worldwide the operational trial for control avoidance. Actually, uh, it's quite strange uh, to see you in life because last two years we uh, all uh, tend to talk to computers. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, actually, inspired by EASA report. Yes, a report was already mentioned today. In 2020, we start to think what we as um, uh, operational center can do for control avoidance. And, uh, um, but let's we start who we are. We are Maastricht Upper Area Operation Control Center uh, situated in core of Europe. We are controlling the flight above um, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and uh, uh, northwest of Germany. As we are really in, co in Europe, as you can see, usually we are controlling 16% of flights going through Europe. But start to think about control avoidance, of course, we needed the solid scientific, scientific background, as we are operational people, we are not scientists. That's why we cooperated with uh, a German Aerospace Center, DLR. Oh, we had already a representative from DLR here. So, and uh, our cooperation, let's do control avoidance trial. Start to, to, uh, start to investigate the issue, we found quite a lot of different opinions. From opinion that control avoidance is a low hanging to fruit, and it's to do this as simple as, yeah, it's very simple, till the opinion that it's not possible to do control avoidance in core of Europe. So as we're situated in core Europe, we start to think, yeah, let's try. So why we and uh, what we have done? And so first, of course, of, of all, of course, we wanted to contribute to uh, research, scientific knowledge of control avoidance and impact of controls on climate. And of course, we would like to understand and test operational procedures. Then we needed to uh, answer the questions, some questions that's is it possible to predict the contrails were correct? Because we want to be, I could say, even surgically correct, not to minimize additional CO2 emission. Another question, of course, to detect contrails, to evaluate work we've done. Another, and, and then important question, to establish workable operational procedures. 
what could be lead to control avoidance. And of course, the question, can we operate under the normal traffic demand? As we remember, the trial was started in 2021, and we wanted to use pandemic situation, actually because of low traffic at that time. So as well, we know from, you all know from scientific uh, investigations that um, contrails, impact of contrails during the daytime is discussable. Even could be, contrails could have a positive effect on climate during the daytime. And the, but during the nighttime, contrails are always bad. That's why nighttime was chosen as well. So, as you can see, the contrail, our trial started 21st of uh, January 2021 and ended 22nd of October 2021. And it was done during the night time from 15 to 5 UTC winter and 14 for UTC summer. Then how did we do contra the, uh, our trial? It was, uh, contrail was avoided tactically. So con uh, controllers, if aircraft went through predicted ISSR area, controllers give the direction to change the altitude, to fly simple, to fly higher or lower. Again, we decided not to deviate aircraft for more than 2,000 feet to minimize additional fuel burn. On the display of the controllers, we display the predicted ISSR areas. You can see this like uh, clouds, uh, white clouds, yeah? If you click on them, you can see the altitude of predicted ISSR area. So every second day, we analyze this control prediction and decided which sector and which altitude could be avoided and make a decision, and this decision were given to supervisors, controllers, and con uh, uh, aircraft flying through predicted ISSR area could be deviated. After looking so many times to contrails prediction and contrails at the sky, we become, of course, the kind of specialists in weather forecast and contrails forecast. And we would say, unfortunately, 2021 was not favorite for contrail prevention. We have really bad weather for contrail formation. And first, beginning of the year, for example, ISSR area were created very low for our airspace. After just as we know, we need the uh, certain temperature and humidity for contrail formation, and weather was not in favor of creation of, probably it was in favor of, uh, of climate, but not for our trial. That is why, taking into consideration the lot of traffic during this time, during pandemic, not a lot of aircraft were deviated. Actually, we deviated a little bit more than 200 aircraft in total. And distribution of this aircraft, you can see on this graph. And you see distribution, it's not equal during the whole year. And most of the nights, we deviated one or two aircrafts only. But still, we were able to do some uh, uh, observations, of course, and uh, experience. This experience gives us really a lot. What What is the most important? I mentioned the most important here. Uh, first of all, data is processed by our partner DLR, as I already said, and there is my, might be a tendency that controls could be avoided. And as a uh, thing, it uh, came quite early, and it was an issue with contrail prediction. Actually, contrail prediction was not good enough. Oh, okay, probably we were expected too much. 
but for our expectation, it was not good enough. And then uh, contrail uh, detection also need to be improved. Another thing uh, I already mentioned, contrail analysis was not automated, and we spent a lot of time to do this manually. And effect of contrails, impact of climate, contrails avoidance and contrails impact of the climate should be, of course, calculated and compare of effect of additional CO2 emission. Then still the key messages of main conclusions of our trial. It's a first that contrail prevention is operationally possible. We can state this, we did this. But it's too early to talk about indicators or to set target on contrail prevention. And that is why we need, of course, to continue research. More research is needed. Research of, of course, magnitude on uh, CO2, uh, of contrail prevention, and compare this to uh, CO2 emission. Then contrail prediction, of course, and observation of contrails. That is why we didn't start with our, our project. If I can ask you to, to, to wrap up, Ilona. Excuse me? If I can kindly ask you to, to, to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, it's the uh, last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, we didn't st uh, stop with our uh, project. We, go, we are going further, and now we are cooperating with a lot of, it's a lot of consortium uh, created last year, like Decalt, the German consortium, we're participating in Caesar project, and we're doing the trial with Nets, uh, Satavia, and Emirates, etc. So, actually, we continue, we need to work all together, because we then only then we can gain the real knowledge and we can do a lot for the climate and as MUAC we can of course share our experience gain knowledge and results with all of you thank you that's it Sorry. Sabrina, thank you very much for, for sharing your experience uh, with, uh, with us. We still have a couple more uh, presentations on solutions that are uh, being uh, tested. And next in line is an Airbus presentation with Alain Desotti, uh, Chief Engineer at Airbus. Um, if you're with us, and if we can kindly ask you to stick to the, to the five minutes as we are running quite uh, over schedule, please. Uh -huh. I will do my I will do my best. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when we did the trial this morning, uh, the, the bandwidth was not very high, so I will just shut down the video when I do the presentation. So apologize for that. But normally, that would make the, the sound a bit better. So let me now share the few the few supporting material, and then we can go. Voilà, so our, our role at, Air, at Airbus is to try uh, very, very often to, to, to understand the various positions, to understand the various uh, technical aspects, and to try to, to integrate them. Uh, on, on that particular subject, if I go to the next slide, on that particular subject, uh, our understanding, our position is that uh, non-CO2 emissions is indeed an important subject for, uh, for the aviation ecosystem. Uh, however, uh, uh, regardless of the importance of the subject, it is also true to say that there's a high level of uncertainty for various reasons. Uh, the NOx effect, for example, is very much dependent on the assumptions you're making for the composition of the atmosphere in the future. And because the NOx effect is not necessarily a direct one, it's a cascade of effect with other chemical components, you need to have a good understanding of what the future will be. So that adds uncertainty. Uh, we've talked a lot about contrails uh, in, in, the, in the last two presentations. Uh, their prediction is not easy, as we've seen with the, with the MUAC experiment, but also their impact uh, over the long term uh, when we take into account fleet evolutions, etc., is difficult to assess. So this being said, uh, we, we, because, because it's important, but also because it's quite, uh, it's quite difficult and they, there's a level of uncertainty, uh, we are really supportive of all the work that is being done to give us better tools 
to make those predictions, to make those evaluations, and to make those assessments from the microscopic um, beginning of the chain, what's coming out of the engine, to the macroscopic, the, the climate impact. And as Airbus, our specific contribution is obviously in the, in the, in the first part, it's in the, the aircraft behavior and the, and the aircraft effect. So this is why uh, we've done very recently some dedicated flight test campaign to support the calibration of the tools, uh, the calibration of the prediction methodologies, to support also the technical and the physical understanding. Alors, you have on the, on, on the chart a picture of, a, of an Airbus A350. We did also the, the same flight, the same type of flight with an Airbus A320. So we have a, that covers well, well the, the, the type of aircraft that are flying today. And the idea was to fly those aircraft with a normal jet A fuel, but also sustainable aviation fuel. And was to, was to observe uh, the type of contracts that were, that were formed, the nature of uh, the, the atmosphere behind, the, behind the, the aircraft. And for that, we had the DLR aircraft that was uh, chasing the, the 350 or the 320, literally sniffing the, the exhaust or the vortex of, the, of, of those aircraft. The idea there was to understand whether, uh, for example, with sustainable aviation fuel, uh, with fuels that contain no aromatic, we would have less soot, less particles, and therefore less possibilities of nucleation and maybe less contrails. Or on the contrary, if there's enough uh, dust in the, in the atmosphere, enough particles in the, the atmosphere, that you just need to bring enough water to have, uh, have contrail formations. Uh, in a similar uh, idea, we want also this year to start testing or emulating what would be the consequences of burning not sustainable aviation fuel, uh, the classical one, but the other sustainable aviation fuel, that is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is different in the sense that it would produce, bring much more, uh, the, the product of the hydrogen com combustion would, uh, would give uh, much more water, but at the same time, uh, no soot, no particles, uh, and maybe bigger crystals that, that would affect the, life, uh, the lifetime of, of the contracts. Uh, so we have dedicated a plan for emulating that by injecting water and then burning real hydrogen to, to understand that. So as you can see, lots of uh, technical activity to feed, uh, to feed the understanding and to feed the, the, the modelization. Now, the other subject, which was the one mentioned by the, the last two presentations, on top of the effect of uh, SAF and, and hydrogen, is obviously the, the operational measures, uh, the, the, the avoidance of, uh, of the production of constraints by avoiding the ISSR region. Alors, that, that concept is very interesting because if we, if we can make it work, it, is, it would have, at the same time, a very fast effect and probably a big effect at the same time. Uh, the, the problem is the practical aspect of putting it into, into practice. Uh, we, need, we don't have on board of the aircraft today, we have temperature measurements, we don't have humidity measurements. So an aircraft is not able to know if it is flying in an ISSR region or not. Uh, there's no uh, surveillance system, satellite base or ground base that would be able to say, yes, we have persistent contracts in that area produced at those altitudes. And the, the weather forecast that we've seen previously are not precise enough. They've not been designed for that. So they are not precise enough. Uh, the discretization with regards to altitude and, and horizontal positioning are probably not sufficient to do what we would like to do by that. Now, this being said, because the subject is important and because we, we don't know everything, uh, we, we don't have all the elements, uh, we need to work things in parallel. So this is, this is why, uh, our view is really to work and to support the understanding, the scientific understanding. It's also to understand and to validate the potential of the new fuels. And at the same time, to construct, to build all together an operational concept that cannot be put into practice today because we don't have the right understanding. But as soon as we would get the understanding, we would have all the bricks to make a mature solution, a solution that is working, that is effective, that is fair, that is making the right trade, and that is operationally uh, making sense and that is viable. Right, so uh, Alain, thank you very much for your presentation. Let us <laughs> 
All right, and last but not least, we're going to be hearing from Olaf Holzer-Schoppel. He's the head of department at the German Environment Agency, UBA, and he's going to talk to us. Uh, what's the potential? What are the options for possibly bringing non-CO2 emissions into the uh, EU ETS? So, uh, Olaf, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Hello, Excellent. and good yes, afternoon, yes, everybody. Seba, if you can speak to, to the time, please. Sorry, I try my best. Just one second. Isn't there a shortcut? Is it like F11 or something? It, it does not work. Um, oh. not, uh, in the test, uh, this um, window uh, went away after some seconds, but now hopefully it works. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to go to this place, but I cannot go because uh, um, these... Um, can, can, can we otherwise just have it as, 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 uh, as we were having before, like even if we cannot expand it at 100%, would that be an option? Yeah, yes, would be an option. There you are, excellent. So that is uh, what yes. I want to have. Yeah. So you can see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the possibility to send the results of the research projects we in the German Emissions Trading Authority have commissioned in the last uh, years about the inclusion of non-CO2 effects of aviation in the European Emissions Trading System. The inclusion of um, non-CO2 effects in an emissions trading system, like the European one, um, would have the effect that these effects would get a price, so that airlines which use climate-optimized trajectories get an economic advantage. For that, it is important, as CO2 and non-CO2 are not directly linked, that non-CO2 effects can be calculated and priced by its own, and not just as a factor of CO2. Furthermore, at least the most important non-CO2 effects, that is NOx and uh, cirrus clouds, have to be monitored and calculated on a single flight basis with a reasonable accuracy. That is exactly what we have done with our research. At a glance, the research and development done by the German Aerospace Center, DLR, and others in the last five years is proving that at least a monitoring and reporting system for non-CO2 effects of aviation can be integrated in the emissions trading directive already now in the ongoing review of the directive. The first research project, finished already, had a more general focus and came to the conclusion that regarding the climate effects, the scientific basis is reasonably sufficient, the data availability is given, and the data collection is technically feasible, but nonetheless, a larger effort in comparison to the CO2 alone. The main graphic is the one you can see on the slide. There are different calculation methods which differ in climate mitigation potential on the one side and the effort for the MRV activities on the other side. As you can imagine, the larger the mitigation potential, the larger also the necessary MRV efforts. And both ends, a constant factor on CO2 and a full weather and location dependent calculation method have disadvantages. The constant factor is too simple and set false incentives as the focus on CO2 penalizes climate optimized routings, which might have more full burn, but far less non CO2 effects. The full weather and location dependent calculation method is good, but seems too complex to start with. But the good news is we don't have to wait for the full weather based solution with a latitude height dependent factor, we have a reasonably exact method which seems the best compromise between simplicity 
and climate mitigation potential. And therefore, we started a second research project to test the monitoring and reporting with this method. This ongoing project focuses on the practical testing of the monitoring and reporting system of non-CO2 effects. The DLR there works together with an airline, EAT, which provided necess the necessary real flight data for the calculation of the respective non-CO2 effects for 400 inter-European and intercontinental flights. With this data, the DLR is able to calculate the emission indices and the CO2 equivalents of the main non-CO2 effects, that is NOx and Cirrus, for each flight in a highly automated manner. There were no significant problems found. Uh, the data quality was very high. Furthermore, a simplified non-CO2 estimation method using a cluster analysis tool is far advanced in its development and can be used for data gaps and to perform validity checks. So, having developments, the results of our research projects in mind, we see only advantages in starting immediately with the monitoring and reporting of non co 2 effects, whereby immediately means that it should be included in the upcoming version of the emission striding directive. When included, monitoring, reporting, and verification processes can be tested and improved as in 2010 and 11, when aviation was integrated in the EU ETS without a surrender obligation in the first two years. Uh, this can be done with real flight data, flight data, so airlines can familiarize themselves with all aspects without additional costs for allowances. And by fully integrating the non-CO2 effects in the emissions trading system only at a later stage, there is sort of a stopping possibility in case there are unforeseen problems before it comes to further costs. If such problems arise, they can be handled and solved before going further. So our overall conclusion of all this is that it is not necessary to wait for another probably eight years until the next review process takes place, but uh, can start now. So in my, in our personal view, we should do so. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think I got the five minutes. Interesting. Thank you very much, Olaf, for this uh, last presentation and bringing also a very, very interesting idea that we're going to be able to uh, discuss uh, further on in our next panel. So um, we still we have about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A based on our, our past uh, presentations. Ilona, there's probably going to be some questions also addressed to you, so uh, feel free to, to take the stage over here. Um, is there anyone uh, here in Brussels that would want to ask a question? We have, I think, three questions. Okay, so let's start um, over here. We had our first uh, question. Were you? Okay. Yeah, please make sure to stick it to time. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a personal question, Niklas Cikosman, and from the European Commission to the um, to Airbus. When flying 100 meters behind an A380, doing flight tests, where did you find the volunteers to do so? <laughs> right. So let's let's pick uh, two more two more questions and then briefly come back to to our speakers. There was there was a question at the at the back, I think. Who was it? Gentleman over there. Uh, hello, my name is Bill Hemmings. My question is for Mr. Donotti, or probably Dr. Donotti of, uh, of Airbus. Um, it's not been mentioned at all so far, but we're only three hours into this conference, that there's been a major Horizon project called JetScreen looking into all these issues, right? Seven million euros or more of European taxpayers' money was put into this project along with contributions from uh, the airline industry in particular, Airbus, Safran, who are here today, uh, and other organizations. And Mr. Desotti, you will know very well that in late 2019, Airbus invited CE Delft and David Lee from Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Manchester University to come to Toulouse, because they told me about the visit, 
to, to do studies into reducing aromatics and soot in, not in SAF, but in kerosene, right? The report was finished in February 2020. I know that because if you read the EASA report, it refers in great detail to CE Delft forthcoming and saying very clearly that it is quite feasible to reduce aromatics and soot almost completely uh, in aviation kerosene today. So Airbus has now set out some plans uh, to go down the SAF route question, and please. to go down the hydrogen route. My question to Airbus is why has that report of CEDOF that was finished in February 2020, more than two years ago, why has it not been published? I've been told that it hasn't been published because Airbus says it's confidential. I don't believe it's confidential. I believe it's an open desktop research. And so my question to Airbus is, will you agree now in this public webinar that Airbus will release CE Delft to produce the report so that JetScreen actually can produce it because it's part of a JetScreen project and so that the parliament and the co-decision can actually have a proper discussion about this issue. Thank you. Um, we have one, one last question here at the front. Uh, if we can just like take it quickly and, and, and please uh, keep, it, keep it short. Yes, uh, Eric Lombard, st uh, stay grounded. Uh, it's a question to Olaf uh, about the MRV uh, system, prediction system. It doesn't uh, seem to include the nature of the fuel and the arom aromatics. Why is, why is that? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, then uh, maybe for uh, allusions, maybe we could start for, with uh, Airbus, with Alain Desautif. Uh, I'd like to uh, quickly answer. Alors the, the first question on flight test, I think uh, <laughs> this is quite typical of, uh, of what people are doing. So they were, the, obviously, it's a, it's a delicate, uh, delicate manuals, but uh, they, are, they are being done by, by professionals. And the second one, uh, I, I, I cannot answer, uh, I don't answer at the moment. So I will uh, be happy to, to address uh, your questions with, with my colleagues that have dealt with uh, the subject precisely. Mm -hmm. Then Olaf, if I could get back to you on the question on the on the MRV system. Um, yes, but I have to admit I'm not sure whether I can give a, um, a um, sufficient answer as I'm, I'm not so deep in in the in the um, project itself that I can uh, give the answer why um, this is it is not uh, done. I'm not even uh, sure that it is uh, indeed not done. Maybe it's um, in a part of, of the, um, the, the, the um, calculations the DLR is doing. Um, so uh, if to get a correct answer, I have to go back to the DLR. Um, if you send me an email or give me uh, your details, I can uh, go back to you with the, with the answer. But unfortunately, right now, I can uh, not give a full answer story. All right, thank you. Thank you very much to, to all of you. Um, I'm afraid that we are going to have to uh, uh, to cut off this uh, Q&A session, but I mean, I'm sure once again that the speakers will be uh, available to answer any additional uh, questions on their respective projects and respective research that you may have. So uh, thank you very much to, to all of you, to Laurent, to Guillaume, to Ilona, Alain and Olaf for their, for their presentations. And... Uh, Round of applause. And uh, we're heading towards our very last, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, part of the, of the event, which is our final panel discussion on who does what really, now that we uh, have updated ourselves with the, with the latest uh, development. So uh, we're going to have a full house on stage because all our, our speakers are going to be with us here in Brussels. So if I can kindly ask uh, all of you to, uh, to be joining the stage. We have uh, Marilyn and, and yeah. 
All right, so um, time to, I think, to, to, to conclude the event based on, on what we've been hearing all afternoon. We have seen like what the status quo is, what has been in the pipeline like up until now and which are the different solutions that are being investigated, that are being considered. So now it's time to look ahead and to think uh, what can we do next to address non-CO2 impact and to really, to, I believe, to place the importance that this issue uh, deserves on the political agenda. So you will be hearing from, from policymakers and also from, from the industry on what, uh, what's the road ahead for us. So uh, in order, so we have uh, Marilyn Bastin, she's uh, Head of Aviation Sustainability at Eurocontrol. Uh, and next we have... Uh, Please, if if, uh, if 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 we could please keep it keep it low uh, on on stage, please. Um, then uh, next we have uh, Jesper van Manen. He's a senior policy officer in sustainable aviation at the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure. Um, we have Jane Amilat with us. She is a head of unit of low emissions future industries at the European Commission, DGRTD, on research and development. And then uh, we also have with us Thomas Reinhardt. He's the managing director at Airlines for Europe. So thanks uh, to all of you for, for being with us. Um, I think uh, we can have uh, quite an interesting conversation ahead. So again, we have prepared a few questions if, if we can be mindful of, of the time so that we can also then afterwards enjoy our evening and the networking reception that we have here in Brussels. Um, I would like to start a little bit to understand like who is doing uh, what, so to say. So I would like to start with, uh, with Thomas uh, from the perspective of the industry. Um, and I'm very interested in understanding um, how are airlines overall taking into account their, all, their overall uh, non-CO2 impacts? Um, I believe the aviation industry released recently a, an, a 2050, uh, Destination 2050 roadmap on, um, uh, to address the climate impacts of aviation. So I'm curious to understand how, um, how the non-CO2 impacts are, are addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, first of all, uh, to t &E for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to represent the airline's view um, in the conclusive or the concluding panel. Um, but first of all, airlines, uh, looking at airlines world, um, I'd like to stress first of all that the top priority will always be safety, safety first. And, and that's an important point because uh, we've heard this afternoon uh, a couple of stories from, uh, from the OEM side, from, from the research institutions and, and uh, also from a fuel perspective, from the aspect on safety. Uh, before we draw any conclusions on uh, any effect of uh, non-CO2 from an operational perspective, that's very important. The second point is, of course, is the OPEX for airlines. Airlines are a very cost-driven sector. The last couple of years have certainly not made it any, any easier uh, uh, for us, uh, also towards our supplier. Uh, so, so the, um, but the OPEX at the same time, I would say, is, is a win-win. I think has always been a win-win. I think the difference now with Destination 2050 and the 2050 target has now triggered, accelerated uh, the process. But what I mean is um, uh, fuel can be up to a third of the cost uh, to operate a flight. So what airlines have automatically done all the time is to work very closely with, uh, with the OEMs and with um, companies like, like, um, like Airbus uh, present here today and to engine manufacturers to reduce the fuel burn. Yeah. And so as you reduce the fuel burn, you keep the cost uh, at an acceptable level in a normally functioning market. Let me be very clear on this. Um, and thereby also reducing uh, emissions, all emissions, and including non-CO2 emissions. Because all the report on Destination 2050 was, of course, for the reasons we all know very well, focusing on CO2. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, we had to focus on reducing CO2 emissions uh, focused, and the policy in 5055 is quite normal that uh, that, that focuses on, on CO2 effects. But, but basically, we, we are committed in destination 2050 to go to net zero by 2050. There is really no way back, crisis or no crisis, because currently you are sort of experiencing two crises at the same time. So the commitment of destination 2050 for the aviation, entire aviation sector is, is there and it's up to the highest level. And uh, apart from the fact that it will cost us and eventually the passenger a lot of money, uh, flying will become more expensive. Um, that's that's first thing. The second thing is to come uh, to your question. Is um, uh, I think it's been clear, clearly shown again this afternoon is that 
measuring uh, the effect of non-CO2 is a very complex challenge. You know, we're not there yet, um, especially because the modeling systems uh, we're using today are not are not apt for it. It's difficult to calculate contributions caused by a range of uh, what I would call atmospheric physical processes, how the air moves, chemical transformations, microphysics, radiation and transport, etc. Despite all of that, let me be very clear: huh? uh, from an A3 perspective, the airlines we recognize that contrails and NOx have an impact on climate, um, uh, as agreed by the scientific community. What we do um, ask for is to um, see more conclusive uh, evidence uh, before we start thinking about regulation and more policy. It makes no sense putting the card in front of the horse, talking about pricing of non-CO2 effects before actually know what non-CO2 is actually doing um, and what we can do about it. Just on, um, I would say, another positive note is that um, as a 4 we fully uh, support the research um, uh, that's made or been done to avoid um, ISSR, which was mentioned a couple of times. We also encourage our pilots to respond favorably to the, the MUAC uh, solicitations. Uh, we are in the context of becoming more uh, climate neutral, um, renewing our fleet uh, as we speak. And as been said this afternoon, new aircraft, new engines automatically will give you uh, better performance in terms of emissions. And that includes also in terms of non-CO2 effects, uh, including NOx, but also contrails. Uh, in terms of the use of new fuels, we've discussed it as well. Um, I think, again, we need to be careful not to endanger the safety aspect. So whatever we do, safety will be number one. And this is, of course, the cooperation uh, with, the, with the OEMs, with the manufacturers and the fuel suppliers is going to be absolutely absolutely key. So for us, I think to, to stop there, conclude there for the moment is from an A4E perspective, uh, we ourselves are also investing in research through various national and European projects, and we continue to work uh, with, with the suppliers for obvious reasons, including to look at the impact of non-CO2 and how we can improve the performance on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thomas. So we, I think we can continue on, on this uh, perhaps reversed order, depending on, on where you're looking at. Uh, if I can turn to you, Jane, from a European Commission perspective, um, we've already hear, heard some, some of the main issues that the European Commission is, is looking at. But from a research perspective, what innovations is the, the EU and the Commission in this case uh, looking at? And what are the tools in, in, in hand to, to, to be supporting them when it comes to uh, studying the, the non-CO2 impacts of aviation? Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I will start with two small personal messages. The first one, I want to reinforce um, what William Toss just said at the beginning. I think we should really shift away from oil, from crude oil, refined oil uh, import. Uh, because in the mid and long term, of course, it has an impact on climate, but I think in the short term, we see uh, what's happening at our border. It's a catastrophe that we continue financing systemic killing of civil population. I think this is really very clear for me that we should shift away. Uh, the second thing is that, okay, um, there was a lot of talk about what should be done if we are doing something, do nothing. Uh, okay, we have this Fit for 55 package, and it was already mentioned, and I think, okay, it's not perfect, but at least we do things huh? uh, on the refuel EU aviation, on the EU ETS. Uh, so we mentioned also, uh, DG Move mentioned also the uh, fuel taxation directive. And here, as a, as a citizen, personally, I don't understand why we don't have taxation on kerosene and also on heavy fuel for maritime. I, I also cover maritime in my unit, and it would help us a lot also to, to find this uh, new um, innovative uh, situation, or innovative technology, sorry. Uh, to turn back to the non-CO2 climate impact. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we heard we have a lot of uncertainties, but uh, I think we finance in the EU uh, and also through the member states a lot a lot of projects in the past 20 years on this uh, we saw some of them on the screen uh, what we try to do is to remove the uncertainties on the phenomena to understand it better uh, but also to look at mit potential mitigation uh, uh, solutions um, yes we still have uncertainties but it's, it's clear it's a warming effect so not to act would not be uh, reasonable, I would say, because uh, 
yeah, we have to start some, somewhere. I think uh, it's like, like this in life, if you have a problem, you have to start somewhere. And, I'm, 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 and I see that people are moving. Eh? We see also uh, airlines, because we saw also this Amelia, this, uh, in this Umwelt Bundesamt, there was also an airline, Leipzig, whatever, I don't know. I don't know. Manufacturers, Airbus, Afro. so I think everybody starts moving, it's very good. Uh, we, we, like it was mentioned, I think first thing is to, to monitor a report of that. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the first thing, and I think we have enough information to use all this software. Of course, it's not perfect. There may be some inconsistencies, but I think we can improve that over time, the monitoring and reporting. And as long as it doesn't have any impact uh, on, on, the, on the airlines, it's just to report. I think it should be uh, reasonable to do that. Uh, then we talked a lot on, on SAF, uh, fuels, uh, yeah, I think we should really do something and, uh, and not only on SAF, also on, on current fuel uh, we, are, we, are, we are using. Um, and for this also, it's very important for me to work with the industry, so we should not do things uh, like from the, and that's what we do on a daily basis, not from the, like, like uh, yeah, just for, from our, our papers or whatever. Uh, and a second very important element for me is incentives, yeah, because, um, yeah, I mean, like we do on CO2, on reduction of CO2, uh, we invest in a lot of projects, uh, we try to find uh, incentives also uh, for, 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 for the industry, so I think, um, yeah, I just want to say it's not like just to punish, huh? and we want our industry also to continue uh, being uh, successful internationally. So I think we should work hand in hand, and we will continue with our project. We have a new project upcoming on non CO2 uh, uh, climate impact uh, on, on, on Horizon Europe. We have ongoing project, uh, and we will continue to go in this both direction. Uh, Cesar is also co covering. Uh, I think Euro Control will mention this. Uh, the routing, so I think we will continue to, to do this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, Jasper, if I can ask you a little bit about the Dutch perspective, because we're talking about quite an important aviation market uh, at the end of the day. So could you talk to us through a little bit of how the Netherlands is, is dealing with non-CO2 non impact and, and how do you think that this ambition can, can be ramped up at the EU level based on, on the different options we've been listening to today? Yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Great. Um, so, as you said, the Dutch aviation market is uh, is, is quite a large one, um, and I think it stands to reason, as we have a lot of intercontinental flights and a lot of CO two emissions are are on the intercontinental side, the non CO two uh, footprint, as it were, is probably also quite uh, large if we look at our at our territory. So, how are we dealing with non CO two? Well, that's my job description. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, if we were, I might not have a job anymore either. Uh, but there's two things I think we're, we're structuring it along two lines. Um, one side is uh, more of a sort of a long-term policy agenda. So based on the SEASTA report and the recommendations in that, which ones do we think make sense from a national perspective? And, and how would we pursue them you know, at the national European global level? Uh, now are also actions missing perhaps from the ASA report uh, and the other side is uh, is a bit more fundamental is, is get more some more insight into what the problem is from a national perspective so as i said we have a lot of intercontinental flights but does this also mean that dutch aviation produces a lot of contrails or not that's very important for the first step of course because then that determines whether or not we will try to pursue control mitigation ourselves nationally so not quite there yet but we're working on it and at the European level, uh, I think uh, it's good to start with something I think we're doing quite well in Europe, not just because Jane is sitting next to me, but we're, of course, uh, a lot of money is going into, uh, into research uh, on non-CO2. And I think a, a big part of useful non-CO2 research around the world is funded uh, by, uh, by the EU. Um, and that's, you know, it's fundamental research, but also on, uh, on control or mitigation and zero emission aircraft. Uh, but at the same time, this EASA report, uh, I think, is not a uh, sort of spontaneous bottom-up report which just came up, but is something that was obligated in the ETS directive uh, in Article 30 to be written. So that's, in terms of dynamic, I think that's something we need a bit more of uh, nowadays. So uh, a more structured policy dialogue between national, uh, national policy experts and also a political debate. And I think we should kickstart that, basically uh with elements we want to have included in the in the fit for 55 package 
right? So I see that there, there are two main things that, that you might be, that you need, let's say. So on the one hand, like more data, perhaps like understanding better, like what are the national impacts and then like really having this, this dialogue among stakeholders at EU, national, industrial level, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to expand very briefly, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, I think so. This this insight, you know, there's two, there's two parts to it. Um, on the one hand, it's what is the non CO2 impact of aviation from the Netherlands? Is that more or less than the global average, basically? But the other side is also linked, I think, to destination 2050, for example. We see a lot of net zero CO2 uh, ambitions lately with roadmaps under them, saying things like we want a lot of SAF and hydrogen powered aircraft. But that also has an impact on our non-CO2 emissions in the future. So it's kind of what is the national problem and also how much of that problem will already be solved by CO2 policy levers. Excellent, Jesper. Thank you very much. So last but not least, uh, we have uh, Marilyn with Eurocontrol with us. Um, Marilyn, we have heard uh, from, from your colleague Ilona the, the efforts made in terms of uh, contrail prevention. So I'm curious to, to hear um, which other innovations is uh, Eurocontrol uh, looking into or, or, or expecting? So first of all, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure being here. And I would like to thank Tini for organizing this event because indeed we are speaking so much about CO2 and I think it's really important to work on CO2. So let's be clear from a network uh, manager point of view, ultimately we would like to, pro to provide the best climate trajectory to all our stakeholders. Uh, but as you have seen with Ilona's presentation, when it comes to a country's avoidance, it's still not so easy to implement it at a network level. Uh, we need to be very cautious on this because CO2 will remain in the atmosphere for 100 years, which is not the case with non-CO2. So it's really important when we work on solution that we don't degrade uh, the global assessment when it comes to CO2 and non-CO2. So it's why, uh, of course, we are still working with MUAC on this and we will follow the next step because it's really important that we better assess uh, the global benefit of the avoidance of control. Because as I said, CO2 remains longer in the atmosphere, so we need to be sure that we are not going to provide more emission at the end of the day. But we are also, of course, working on other non-CO2 projects. So for us, in our CESAR 3 agenda, this is one of our highest priority. So we are working with the industry. sense the migrating birds to try to reduce emission but we are also working on electric taxi and many other projects to improve our uh, optimized uh, trajectories and I think that one of the game changers will be TBO, uh, what we call trajectory-based operation. It will require a lot of innovation, but I think it's really crucial. In short, it's really to increase predictability in the network, and it will, of course, help to reduce uh, our fuel inefficiency in the network. So basically, in a nutshell, what we are doing. Thank you very much, Marilyn. By the way, for those listening to us online, we understand that there might have been a small a technical issue but it's all been sorted so we're, we're working hard to you know make sure that uh, 
all the messages like, are, are received uh, clearly. So thanks a lot to all of you for your, uh, for your patience. And, 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 and thanks, Marilyn, of course, for your, for, for your remarks. I hope uh, that at least the key message was, uh, was, sent, uh, was sent through. So um, I, would, I would like to, to perhaps just quickly also address that. I mean, we are, we are seeing some, some very interesting examples in the, in the aviation industry and for airlines. So uh, for instance, something that I would, I would want to, to ask with um, to ask Thomas is that what are the conditions that you think that need to be in place to um, encourage perhaps um, at, at the moment at least some kind of uh, voluntary um, action or follow the example of some airlines for instance we've seen Amelia the, the, the French regional airline and and make this a, uh, a norm uh, and, and, and the market what do you think? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. I, well, as, as I said um, maybe earlier, is is logically, um, you know, airlines and what Marilyn mentioned uh, is very good. They look at cost efficiency, and uh, I, th I think that's going to be uh, a very important driver to reduce uh, emissions overall, uh, including for uh, non-CO2 emissions. Um, so if we can if we can continue to push that drive of cost efficiency of the network as well, as Marilyn mentioned, the uh, um, the, the trajectory based operations, um, airlines will automatically choose uh, the route which is, uh, which is most cost efficient, uh, which with less, less fuel burn. Now, the, um, the, that's why the cooperation with the network manager is, well, there is cooperation for all airlines, is, is really crucial. Um, without that, we would lose out uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, that's one, so operationally. Then technology-wise, I, um, um, I think the three areas where we can uh, uh, continue to do more, it was mentioned uh, many, you know, often this afternoon, is staff. Right? So the, the potential of increasingly get more staff, and yes, staff will be more expensive, but I think we inherently accept that. I mean, this is a reality of life as technology uh, price will increase as well. So, but the potential of SAF and going to 100% SAF, I mean, this is really the future. This holds a lot of potential. We know it's going to ask a lot of the entire sector, not only of airlines, but also of airports, um, even of uh, ASPs. Um, secondly, I think, the, as I mentioned before, the new engine um, and, and aircraft technologies. And then third but not last, but then I'm back to the ATM, is to uh, optimization of the, of, of the network. So we know that those things, and you will find those back in the 2050, because the principles, uh, the principal measures you find in Destination 2050, uh, you will also find them back if you're talking about non-CO2 emissions. So the, the, the principal drivers, I think, from an operational technology perspective, um, are the same in principle whether you talk about CO2 or non-CO2. I think what is, um, there's a bit of a risk there where we start to talk about non-CO2 non specific policy uh, and measures, regulation, before we actually know, um, you know, what we are talking about, you know. So with CO2 um, emissions, the scientific evidence, this is not done from in two days, you know. This is decades of hard work, of research, and today, since a while, but today clearly there's a general recognition in the context of the Paris Agreement that CO2, we need, really need to tackle CO2. By the way, we also need to tackle methane, but it's not part of today's discussion. But we need to be very honest about ourselves. And I think just to conclude on that, I think it would be unwise not to focus on what we have committed onto now is CO2 reductions. Because as I said, as a byproduct, you will have automatically, if we implement all those measures, a reduction of non-CO2 measures. So let's focus on what we have committed to. It's a huge commitment from the entire European aviation sector, not only airlines. And let's make sure we don't lose focus. That's what I would recommend. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Jay and Jesper, Marilyn, I don't know if you would like to have any reactions to, to what's been said. Please, Jane. Maybe a quick reaction, yeah, because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are not losing the focus on CO2. Uh, we have this big program, Clean Aviation, uh, where we really uh, invest a lot, a lot of money uh, in developing uh, the non-CO2 technologies of the future. I agree with you. It probably has also positive impact on the non-CO2, but I think it doesn't mean that we should not, in parallel, uh, work on non-CO2 non, on non -CO2 because. Uh, well, also, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's more a mid-term uh, thing that we are doing now huh, on, on CO2, so I think we should really uh, work in parallel on both issues. 
Yes, please, Marilyn. Yes, if, if I may on this point, I, I fully agree. Uh, we have to work uh, in parallel, but as I have mentioned in my introduction, it's really important that the solution is not worse you know, than the initial problem. And here, maybe there is something that may help. It's defining uh, a metric which include both CO2 and non-CO2. Why I'm saying this? Because I know that there are already some existing metrics, but it depends the time scale we are looking for. If we look to 25 years, yes, maybe non-CO2 will be the priority. But if we look to 100 years, then it will certainly be CO2. It means then that the solution that needs to be applied are not the same. But for the industry, it's quite difficult to follow because we would need this kind of metric to guide us to know when we implement a solution, will it be really positive at the end of the day? So I think it's really something that we need to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jesper, please. Yeah, just to react actually to your point on the on the climate metrics that's exactly one of the things i think we need to at some point have a, a political debate on it's a case of what is sort of a climate target we're working towards with both co2 and non-co2 policies you know, we can use the gwp 100 metric if we want to but that that is also a political choice if we do it that way or we could i don't know aim for a 2060 temperature change or something else but that is one of the many examples of things i think uh, we need a political debate on and not everything can be solved by the scientists or not everything will be solved by the scientists because it's not their role. Because it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, we were just listening how um, if uh, we would be introducing MRV for, for, for non-CO2 emissions and on, on the EU, this is something that could be could be done already as of, as of now. So that could potentially, couldn't that potentially facilitate the 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 work and understand better what the what the real impacts are about i'm not sure if anybody would want to jump in on this one I start i think yes of Take course us. i mean it would help and even if uh, yeah we understand uh, it's not uh, perfect we would have certainly things as you said uh, also on the matrix on the on the time scale to to really have a to agree and huh? to have a dialogue with uh, everybody and think, okay, that would be something. Uh, but I think if, yeah, if we start, we can learn and uh, try to improve. And as long as it doesn't impose anything on the industry, I think it's already something that uh, we could work on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. I think uh, MRV, yes. I mean, uh, it could be quite tricky if you see um, the, the trouble we had to go through with the MRV we have today, which is uh, covering CO2. Um, so I would just caution for, um, Let's go for something that works. Let's first of all get the evidence together and let's then be pra pragmatic and go for something that, that works and not over haste in the current political debate because this is what we're also talking about, the, the debates in the parliament and, and between commission and, 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 uh, and the council in the context of Fit for 55. Um, again, let's, let's focus on, on what we know, where the evidence is today, scientific evidence. Let's focus on what we can do. Uh, with a system, and I think what roughly the European Commission has proposed in this package overall, um, SAF technology, I mean, all those important things, but a, a huge focus on SAF and, of course, on synthetic fuels, you know, that's where the investments, first of all, will need to go in. And so, um, yes, you know, at the end of the day, the passenger will pay for it. It's not that simple. We need to continue to have a healthy market because without a healthy competitive market, you know, uh, we don't want to go back to the times of, you know, 20, 25 years ago in commercial aviation, I think. But OK, I'm I am diverting a little bit, but let's let's focus on what we know that really works and where we have the evidence for non-CO2 things. Uh, if I may just to complement on what Thomas has just said, uh, if at least there is one consensus, it's really about sustainable aviation fuel, because I was speaking that we should avoid to implement solutions that could worsen the situation. But here with sustainable aviation fuel, there is clearly a consensus that it could work for both CO2 and non-CO2. So I think it's really important now to accelerate uh, SAF production and, and, and of course to, to reduce the cost. Uh, it's really something on which we need to work because it's really essential. It's really something that needs to be done and then can be done now already, which I think is really important. I think we all have the consensus that, that sustainable aviation fuels is really uh, 
one of the keys and something that is really at our um, at our hands to, to be addressing the topic. Probably something that we might, uh, not all of us might agree, is kind of the level of, of ambition that we have so far on, on ongoing legislations. I mean, we've heard uh, the, the rapporteur of the opinion for the industry committee on, on the plans for, for refuel EU and on stepping up the, the ambition, also introducing specific non-CO2 requirements, especially when it comes to um, to aromatics. So if I could just like maybe get a quick round of, 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 uh, of, of thoughts on that, to which extent the, the ongoing uh, legislative processes uh, and, and in these exciting times that we are at the moment for EU climate policy could be doing more to, to, to address that. Who would want to jump in? Jasper, please? Or Sorry, no, on Jane. sustainable aviation fuel, I think, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it looks like a promising and a little bit magic solution, but uh, I don't know who I mean, we are also doing research on, on this, and it's not easy because, uh, well, the price, first of all, but it's not only the price, I think it's the availability, because you saw we have now in the EU quite uh, strong um, guidelines or opinions huh, on, uh, on biofuels, so we cannot do anything, uh, we cannot do everything we want, so it's very strict. Uh, and uh, look where, we, where, where it will come from. Huh? So I think we really have to, and also the amount of renewable energy you need to produce this. Huh? Uh, um, I think, uh, well, if we talk about hydrogen, I don't know, one colleague told me that uh, aviation would use 25% of the hydrogen production 2050. I don't know if it's true, but I mean, it, you, you, we just have to, to be aware of that. Huh? It's not so easy. Huh? It's, uh, it's easy to say, but to do is not so easy. Um, okay. yeah, sure. That's for Marilyn. <laughs> um, yeah, so on the sustainable aviation fuels and, and refuel you, I, I mean, we, we think there really is a potential there for a win-win, and I think we've heard a lot of people say that today. Uh, also, that's also linked very much to this idea of uh, not trying to increase CO2 emissions by having non-CO2 policy. So we think SAF and also cleaner fossil kerosene are basically a win-win and a neutral win option where you where you don't have this trade-off problem and also the idea of, of a climate metric is slightly less important because they're both pointing in in the right direction in the same direction um but then looking at the at the concrete proposal uh Oh, by, sorry, by the way, there's, of course, also the air quality benefit to, to, to mention from both uh, SAF and, uh, and cleaner kerosene. And, of course, the, uh, the energy independence issues also mentioned before uh, from a SAF perspective. And then if we look at, at concretely at Refuel EU, we think there's essentially three uh, options or levels of what, we could, what you could do in there. And uh, level one, I think, is completely no regret. That is basically include something like the Article 30 from ETS in Refuel EU and say, ask the Commission to, to write a report studying the benefit of, uh, of SAF and, uh, and cleaner fossil kerosene for these, uh, for contrails and for, uh, for air quality. A second option would be MRV here. So that's really MRV of the fuel composition, not the MRV of non co 2 and ETS. Those two can be a bit confusing together. Um, because we really see, and I think it's been mentioned before, is a massive lack of public data uh, on what the uh, on what the average composition is of a fuel in Europe. And I think uh, I'm not sure, but I think on, on generally airlines also don't have access to detailed data on this. They just know their fuel complies with a specification. So there's, there's an issue getting the data from the refinery into into the airlines, into the into the governments. And then the third level would be regulate now. This is, I think, what, uh, what MEP Paulus is proposing. And there we think that is something to probably work towards in a few years' time. But um, I mean, even technically looking, it's a proposal to have a maximum of 8%. Well, I think of safety is a minimum of 8%. So it's already saying the window will be infinitesimally, infinitesimally small. It's a bad word for a panel. Uh, but then you need to get exactly that level. That's a, a bit strange, I think. Uh, and we just don't have the, the impact assessment. Even if all the science was, was perfect, we need to know what are the current concentrations in fuel and how much money would it cost to reduce it to that level. And you have an informed policy decision. So we think basically levels one and two together is what we should do, because that provides the data for future policy discussions. Right. Marilyn. 
Yeah, I would like to come back to what Jen has said about the level of energy that we need for producing SAF. Indeed, it's really a, one of the issues. So currently we are working on a study to quantify the, the, the energy that we would need to decarbonize the long haul flight. And it requires a huge amount of energy. Uh, but I must say it's not a problem specific to uh, the aviation sector. It's actually, for me, the real challenge of decarbonizing any industry. It will be the amount of renewable energy that we would need for any sector. So it's why we really need to work on this if we want to decarbonize uh, the aviation sector, but not only the aviation sector, any other sector. So indeed, I fully agree, it's really one of the main key issues for decarbonizing our human activities. If it, it can yes. just 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 add on to that, so so uh, looking at the ambition, uh, the welcoming ambition from Airbus to uh, offer um, commercial commercially offer uh, by 2035 hydrogen propulsed uh, aircraft, commercial aircraft, um, you would almost uh, be able to move towards a and some countries have understood this in in the EU to move to a, a hydrogen uh, society, you know, hydrogen based society. Uh, it's across, this is how big the challenge is, you would need a, an entire across Europe in hydrogen uh, industrial policy. Um, we should all be moving to hydrogen as a, a carrier of the energy, which is a very efficient carrier of energy. If that doesn't happen, I would, I could even argue then, you know, we have a problem in aviation as well, because we are only a relatively small uh, con consumer, or we will be a small consumer. Uh, of, of hydrogen. So that's actually very important. So it, it goes even beyond what, what we would like to see in aviation. It's a societal challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. We are, we are nearing the end of our, of our discussion. Um, we've touched upon many, many topics. Uh, also, you know, related to fuels overall, CO2 as well. But um, perhaps at, at the end of the day, we're, we're coming together here as because uh, we see that, the, that this is an important topic to be to be addressing. And even if we don't have all the answers, there's probably some steps that um, that we can that we can do. So if I can just ask you to summarize with one sentence or just a couple couple words, what is the first step that we can do to really address non CO2 emissions based on? on what we already know in base on what is at our disposal, let's say like the low hanging fruit, like one first step that we can all uh, industry policymakers uh, take. So I'm not sure if, uh, if we can take this or, or maybe we can start with it's Thomas one, again. Yeah, so for me it's further reduce fuel burn. I mean, if it's one, one sentence, further reduce fuel burn and invest, heavily invest in sustainable aviation fuels and synthetic fuels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jane. I would say we have to start with this matrix and in view of uh, monitoring and reporting. So to really have a consensus, start a discussion and have a consensus on this. Excellent. Yes, per. Well, I'd, I'd say SAF, but I think the horse has been beaten to death today as well. Um, I also think it's a case of starting in sort of realization from both businesses and, and, and political and government sides that start wondering, even if we don't have all the data right now for non-CO2 impact, would we still be making the same decisions if non-CO2 were regulated? Okay, so everything has been said already, but I would say reducing our fuel consumption, uh, accelerating staff production, and defining a good metric and climate target uh, in such a way that we know the direction that we have to follow. Excellent. So, Marilyn, Jasper, Jane, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, exciting last uh, discussion and, and session of, uh, of this afternoon. So, if I can ask for a round of applause for those who are in person, and maybe those online also want to join for a round of applause as well, of course. <laughs> Feel free to do so. <laughs>
Uh, first, let me just say that I was looking forward to joining this summit in Brussels as it would be the first important international event he brought for me to attend in person after the pandemic. But uh, due to unforeseen and last minute changes in my schedule, I will have to address you from my office in Slovenia, which is, uh, and I'm proud to say that, a country also renewed for top-notch uh, sustainable and carbon-free technological advancement in aviation. Uh, let me start by quoting the president of the European Commission, uh, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, during her 2020 State of the Union address, stating that carbon must have its price because nature cannot pay this price anymore. I could not agree more with her statement. What I would like, I would add here is that unfortunately, there are also significant non-carbon effects which nature cannot pay for anymore. I therefore regret to see that non-CO2 emissions in aviation have been put, put uh, on a sidetrack in the EU legislative processes in the last 15 years. Even now, the union's architecture for green transition, the Fit for 55 package, still includes no tangible measures on non-CO2 effects of aviation. I realize, of course, that addressing the non-CO2 issue in an effective, refined, and commensurate way is a challenge. Is it an intrinsic problem with no silver bullet solution? However, I'm confident that in these 15 years, since the aviation has been included under ETS, Solid scientific evidence and research have been accumulated to finally give the Commission and the co-legislators a concrete push in, the direction, in this direction. Currently, for the Parliament, there is at least four core elements in the revision of the ETS directive related to aviation that will require strong and ambitious political breakthrough. And addressing the non-CO2 impacts is one of them along with dealing with the, with the scope of the ETS, phasing out free allowances, and ensuring aviation ETS revenues are streamed for enhanced development of sustainable aviation technologies. I'm therefore pleased to see that in the amendments to this directive, at least the more progressive parliamentary groups have come forward with a set of concrete measures related to non-CO2 impacts. As said before, we need to demand from the Commission and the Council a credible kickoff in this regard and prevent this issue to be swept under the carpet for another 10 years. What is crucial is the need for more data and transparency on non-CO2 emissions. What we would therefore like to look into is the possibility to, to apply MRE to the non-CO2 emissions more concretely to establish a pilot monitoring, reporting and verification scheme with the objective of modeling an MRE methodology adapted to the characteristic of non-CO2 emissions and their climate impact. A robust CO2 equivalence calculation for non-CO2 effects needs to be developed by ensuring that a necessary set of non-CO2 related data is monitored, reported and verified at cruising altitude. Recent studies indicate that monitoring and reporting for non-CO2 effects during cruise is in principle already possible. As this process needs to be developed further, I would also like to see in the revised directive funds at disposal to provide advanced improvement of monitoring and reporting technologies for non-CO2 emissions. In addition, it is necessary to ramp up funds for research in the formation of contrails and serious clouds, as well as to further explore the application of mitigation options in this area. For example, possible rerouting or flying at a lower altitude which has the possibility to reduce contrails and serious clouds while not significantly affecting the rise in CO2 emissions. And finally, if I return to Ms. von der Leyen's words in the of the necessity of pricing carbon considering that nature is not able to pay the price anymore, it, it should also be necessary to look into policy options for pricing non-CO2 emissions. I believe 
the pilot MRE scheme for non-CO2 mentioned before should be an essential move towards this goal. Finally, such a measure could also have an important contribution to enabling additional funds for more research into non-CO2 impacts and technological solutions that would reduce those impacts. So to wrap up and turning to some of my closing remarks, I think we speak in an unison when saying that to date, the climate impact of aviation is not adequately accounted for, be it in the EU or globally. Recalling the recent scientific findings and acknowledging the European Parliament's progressive legacy ever since aviation has been included in ETS, I believe it is high and right time to achieve some meaningful progress in the revision of the ETS aviation directive, especially with the realm of the non-CO2 impacts. At the end of the day, we have a firm legal argument for enabling a viable policy instrument that would finally start taking into consideration the mitigation of non-CO2 impacts of aviation, even though, like I said, unfortunately, we do not have a silver bullet solution. And here I have in mind the respect of the precautionary principle enshrined in the treaties, which is part and parcel of the Union's environmental architecture. So to conclude with, I would like to thank the organizers for the, the opportunity to deliver this address and express my congratulations for promoting these discussions with, with such a wide variety of speakers and experts in the field, as I believe such dialogue is indeed essential for making important substantial contributions to the current legislative process. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Bergles, for concluding uh, our event today and, uh, and for being with us. Now, last but not least, uh, before we go on with our evenings, we have, uh, I'd like to welcome on stage TNE's own Andrew Murphy, who will give some concluding thoughts on today's, uh, today's afternoon. So, Andrew, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Some brief concluding remarks. Um, as I see, the, the drinks already being put out. Um, and so much has been said today that's been extremely interesting and extremely welcoming. Um, but there's not much I can add to it, um, except to say thank you uh, for those who've come out, uh, particularly for those who followed online and for those who organized it. I think we had a really good discussion. Um, we didn't agree on everything. I think that's, that's a, a sign of the complexity of the topic and the seriousness of what we're trying to address, which is to um, make sure that the aviation sector is, is better reconciled um, with the urgent need to reduce its climate impact. And we're, we're all fully aware of how urgent that need is, uh, from the IPCC reports to the news articles to the physical changes in the weather, which is, which is and the climate, which is happening um, partly as a result of, of aviation. Um, so I think, you know, what we did achieve today is a recognition that we need to do much more to address these CO2 and these non-CO2 effects. And so how do we speed up that action? How do we do so much, do much more? Um, I think a first step is we need a lot more openness and transparency on the data and the information that's out there. You know, th there is a history in, in the climate um, area of um, data and information not being made fully public and, and the debate being um, undermined by an absence of that information. And we know from contrail formation to aromatic content to routes taken by aircraft, you know, we need maximum transparency from all the actors in the process um, so we can all make the best informed decisions and so that regulators can act in the most timely means possible. Uh, a lot, if, you know, one word that's used a lot today is the issue of uncertainty. Um, yeah, and you know, uncertainty has, um, has been an issue in climate policy for a long time. Uncertainty is something we need to address. It's something we need to minimize as much as possible. Uh, uncertainty is a serious issue, but it certainly isn't a reason um, to go slow on climate action. Um, we can reduce uncertainty through more research. We can reduce uncertainty through more transparency. That's what we should do. And as we reduce uncertainty, we should step up the ambition of our climate action. Um, we saw a lot of support today for some of the no regrets policies, be they in aromatic reduction, be they, be they in rerouting. We also saw a lot of excitement for SAFs and for mandating SAF use. But I think we'll be lowering our ambition a bit if we just limit our ambitions to blending in more SAF 
and if we don't go for some of those more exciting policy opportunities, such as reducing aromatics um, for the fossil jet fuel, such as rerouting. Um, the aviation sector is behind other sectors in dealing with its climate impact, and so it needs a full drive on all of these measures to make sure it can do much more. Um, and I think we need to make sure that today isn't the end of this conversation. I mean, I, what I saw on the stage today in the discussions is so much information being exchanged, um, so many different ideas. And I think we need to make sure we continue this sort of alliance building and coalition building, because it will be a coalition, it will be an alliance and a sharing of information between industry, between regulators, uh, with NGOs like ourselves who keep giving a push to both to do more. And I'd like to see an event like this to be you know, a regular feature, because we will be having more data, more information available, and so let's keep that going. Um, <clears throat> but we'd also like to see um, the EU institutions, national governments playing that role in bringing together the stakeholders so that we can progress um, this file as much as possible. It's now a year and a half since that famous EASA report. Um, we have indeed, as, as, as um, Magnus pointed out from DG Klima, one of the recommendations was brought forward, uh, which was blending in more SAF. Um, but there's many more EASA recommendations to be brought forward, and we hope in the coming months and years we'll see those recommendations uh, be brought forward. Um, but for now, I'd just like to once again say thank you for all of those who contributed today, um, for the interest and enthusiasm which came from, from many different parts of industry and regulators. And uh, I hope to see you at many more discussions at non-CO2, and I look forward to seeing um, many of these measures being brought forward and to come to fruition and the CS sector being more and more sustainable as we go forward. So thank you all very much. And you're now directed towards the drinks and the snacks. Thank you. All right, so. So that's it for, uh, for this afternoon. Thanks a lot to all of you for joining us on this event, for your thoughtful questions, uh, the speakers for sharing their insights, the team at Transport and Environment, t &E, behind the scenes helping us, also Gene Electra, of course, for making sure that all the technical equipment runs smoothly. And uh, right, on with our evenings. Those who are staying in Brussels uh, can uh, join us for, for some drinks. And to all of you, have a nice evening. Thank you very much.